evening. Welcome to the June 23rd meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Would you all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Carol, would you call the roll, please? Ms. August? Here. Mr. Buffard? Here. Mr. DuPont? Yep. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. Mazur? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Paul? Here. Uh, for the record, since we have a full board this evening, Mr. McGee and Ms. Oglis are non-voting members uh, on the board, but certainly welcome to participate in everything else. Our first item on the agenda this evening is the approval of minutes of June 2nd, 2014. I move to approve. So moved. We have a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? show that to be unanimous. <coughs> Item number four this evening. Planning Board will conduct a public hearing to receive input regarding amendments to the zoning ordinance regarding performance standards for transmission towers and zoning districts where permitted. Mr. Chase. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> Mr. Bacon. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> you know, I'm so used to just letting that roll off the tongue. Ooh. My apologies. No problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm with you this evening in part to present uh, this initiative to you. Um, the Ordinance Committee of the Town Council has been working for a number of months now on uh, steps to take to improve cell phone service, uh, smartphone wireless service <coughs> within the community. Uh, the last time uh, the town updated or changed um, allowances for transmission towers, which are cell towers um, or other antenna, de antenna devices, was the late 90s. A uh, lot's changed since then in terms of expectations and dependency on, on mobile devices, and so the Council Ordinance Committee wanted to bring some changes forward. Um, as part of the work the committee did um, was to actually hire a consultant, an independent consultant, to look at uh, where coverage gaps exist within the community. That's the map that's up uh, on the TV screens and also is, I think, provided in your packages. Um, and it, what it's attempting to illustrate is in green is showing uh, areas of town where there's, there's good coverage within both vehicles and buildings. Um, the orange areas or brownish areas are showing um, coverage, dependable coverage within vehicles, but not necessarily buildings, and the white is the poor coverage areas of the community. Um, so this map and also some advice from the consultant was used by the Ordinance Committee as they worked on, on these amendments um, from a zoning, from a geographical standpoint within the community. So based on feedback by the consultant and some industry professionals that were involved in the process and the ordinance committee's own experiences um, living and, and traveling through the community and wanting to use their, to, their cell phones, et cetera, um, we generated a range of amendments. Um, I'm going to jump to this next map here for you. And the amendments um, are both to the performance standards for transmission towers as, where, as well as where they would be allowed in the community based on um, this proposal. And using the mapping from the consultant, it seemed that um, in general the poor coverage areas of the community are largely within the rural and farming districts, which is the more outlying areas of town both west of the, the main turnpike, and also um, some areas on the eastern side of town in the vicinity of, of Spurwink Road, Black Point Road, and then uh, the, the town kind of boundary with Old Orchard Beach in the southern part of town. Those are areas that don't currently allow transmission towers. The only zones in town where they are allowed today are in the industrial zones, which are on this map as the purple zoned areas. 
um, off of Route 1, the Scarborough Industrial Park, off of Pleasant Hill Road, um, and Muzzy Road, and, and also the Holmes Road area. So one component of the proposal is to broaden where transmission towers are allowed to include the RF districts, which also are the poor coverage areas in the community. The RF zones are also uh, the least dense parts of the community in terms of zoning. Um, it's large lot residential zoning and farming. Um, so the ordinance committee felt that there's more space in these areas. It would be easier to site uh, a tower without um, uh, infringing on abutters. Um, there's larger lots in this area of town um, for towers to be located. Um, another component to this is, is two other zoning districts that um, are closer to the center of town, the Crossroads District, which is the Downs property in the Village Residential 4 there, um, between Sawyer Road and Payne Road. That's up another part of the community that has poor coverage and is, is underdeveloped, so there's some space there for um, towers to go in without um, being too close to smaller, smaller lots. So that's one piece of the proposal. And the other components are changes to the performance standards um, to modernize, modernize the performance standards to some degree and also to encourage co-location of providers on the same tower. Uh, one of the concerns of the ordinance committee was having a number of towers within the same area with different providers on, on the towers to try to minimize that. There's a requirement for co-location of cell carriers to one tower versus multiple towers in the same area. So there's language in the proposed changes <coughs> in that regard. There's also a proposal to increase the height allowance for towers from 100 feet, which is the limit today, to 150 feet to, in part, enable that co-location or multiple carriers and antennas on the same tower um, rather than, you know, two or three hundred foot towers, there could be one 130, 140 foot tower. A few of the other adjustments that are of note is a requirement that should uh, transmission towers become obsolete, no longer be the current technology, there's a requirement for them to be taken down if they become uh, abandoned or unused after a period of time. And um, there are some amendments for um, a different type of antenna attached to buildings. Those are considered telecommunication facilities um, when there could be a cell provider um, using a rooftop or a, a church steeple. Right now, the zoning only allows those type of installations on municipal buildings or places of worship of, uh, on churches. Um, so to better allow for those types of installations to get away from towers, if, if possible, if there's some taller buildings in town um, that can provide uh, these installations, um, the language is proposed to be changes, changed to allow private buildings to, to have these facilities on them and not just be municipal buildings or churches. Um, and that would be a, a planning board review process if it's a building in a commercial zone that you would typically look at uh, through site plan review, or it would be a zoning board of appeals review process if it's proposed in a residential zone, which they <coughs> customarily look at development projects uh, in residential areas. Um, and I'd, lastly, there's some additional language in for transmission towers um, for planning board review, which is currently the case for these and also giving the planning board some um, tools to review the aesthetics of towers, um, ask for perspectives from neighboring properties or roadways, understand how a new installation might fit into the landscape um, and whether there, there needs to be buffering or other things done to ensure that it's uh, fitting into an area properly. So with that introduction, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it back you, to you for public hearing. Thank you. Um, at this point, we're gonna. I will be opening up a public hearing on this <coughs> item. Anybody who would like to address this item, please feel free to approach the podium. State your name and address for the record. 
We ask that you please try to keep your comments to five minutes or less. Um, we also ask that if somebody ahead of you has brought up an issue, please hope that we have heard it. We understand that the issue is there. And um, for respect of others' times, we ask you not to repeat it all the same things over and over again. So with that, I will open up the public hearing. Good evening. I'm Suzanne Foley Ferguson, 331 Black Point Road. Um, I just spent the last four years working on the smart meter case at the Maine Public Utilities Commission, and I've learned quite a bit about radio frequency radiation. And it makes me <clears throat> feel as though I have to I have to do a lot of educating. Um, the fact that this proposal includes no limit to the number of cell towers in our town is very scary to me. I was I was pretty comforted by the fact that the towers were allowed in those three pink zones that you see there that were only allowed in the industrial zones. That was comforting as a resident. Therefore, my what my goal tonight is to ask, encourage you to take a longer look at this um, this change <coughs> for a couple different reasons. And I have three broad points. Um, first of all, allowing unlimited numbers of towers in in those zones. Wh while I understand, I spoke with Dan in length about um, the intent of of co-location. The fact is that um, if they're allowed in a certain area and they meet the performance standards, then they are allowed. And an unlimited amount of towers would be allowed. Um, I'm, so my broad point would be to consider pulling back from family neighborhoods, scenic <coughs> roads, and places where children are located. Um, the, the World Health Organization classifies radiofrequency radiation as a possible carcinogen. I don't know if people know this, but hundreds of studies have disco discovered adverse health effects in clusters surrounding cell towers. And the recommendation is at least um, a half mile to a full mile from children's schools and population centers. So that's 400 or 500 meters. Um, so first I'll start with this. I don't think the intent of planning is to make sure that everyone has any allowed use, particular use is supposed to get 100% coverage. We don't allow gas stations at 100% of the places. Yet here we are using 100% as our goal. So um, if you look at the map, the proposal says let's put it in, let's allow it to be put in all RF zones. I don't necessarily think that's the right method. I think that's where that, that's a good starting point. And then let's look at what other issues are. You could um, improve cell phone reception by allowing it in some of those RF zones, but not all of those zones. If I was a person who bought my property, I mean, one of the big things I think here to understand is that while there's nothing wrong with how the process has been going on, the fact is people don't realize that this is a major change to a zone. If I, bought a, if I built a house in the rural residential farming district and I built my house over there, I would expect that there was going to be no tower next to me. Um, however, this is a major zone change, and we're not notifying all the people in that zone that this is going to be a change. I know this is a little bit different than like a zone change. What it is is it's allowing a use change. But I think that people should be really notified, and they haven't been. Um, the entire Spurwink Road, for instance, is very rural and very scenic. It, it goes along the coast. It's near Piper Shores. Um, I know you can consider in performance standards whether or not a tower should be located that on a case-by-case -case basis. However, if you look at the comprehensive plan, does it jive with what we've encouraged in the comprehensive plan, and that is to maintain the rural character of our community. So one of my questions to the planning board is how are you going to analyze this as it relates to the comprehensive plan um, in allowing for us to maintain some of that character. I know that the town council has been working through its ordinance committee on this issue, but I think it's safe to say the public really hasn't heard much about this change. This is a, is a huge change. Um, and for every tower that comes forward, I realize it might be coming to you for performance standards, but to allow it in that 
huge amount of land in town is a, is is too much, I believe. Um, cell phone towers might, and I don't know, maybe they, they talked about this, uh, might be better evaluated by a contract zone evaluation or an exception, and I don't know if the town council considered that or not because I wasn't following the town council. Um, but I can tell you that, for instance, off of Pleasant Hill Road, the, as chair of the Parks and Conservation Land Board, and we just spent or we just approved, or the town did, I should say, $2 million to buy the Benjamin Farm. Part of what was discussed was how beautiful a view shed that was. And with Williamsburg um, in there, um, a cell tower would change that character quite a bit. So I don't know if that's been considered. And I, and I really think, I guess my goal is that you look at each of the RF zones and say, is it really appropriate in all of the RF zone or just in parts of the RF zone? And then finally, my, the thing that really um, strikes at my heart is my health concerns. Um, many biological effects have been documented at very low intensities, and we have thousands and thousands of um, studies, and we have hundreds specifically on cell towers. We had a, a professor from India testify at the Maine Public Utilities Commission, and I have two, two studies, one 88 pages, another one 50, that I could share with you guys. But what these reported effects, these reviews of all the effects are um, genetic and growth and reproductive effects, uh, increases in um, blood-brain barrier changes, behavioral changes, molecular, cellular, and metabolic changes, and an increase in cancer risk. And that's what the World Health Organization has indicated. Now, it took um, the international agency <coughs> Uh, for research on cancer, which is IARC, called WHO, the World Health Organization. It's, um, it took about 50 years before smoking was identi originally identified as a possible carcinogen to move into the uh, definite carcinogen. In fact, lead isn't even up there yet. Chloroform, um, this is rated as lead. And the reason is because in order to get to be a probable or a definitive carcinogen, they have to define a mechanism. That's the way it reads. And in order to do that, that means at the molecular level. So cell phones have only been in the, uh, around for about 20 years, and the latency of tumor effects is about 20 years. So we really haven't seen any of these. These epidemiology studies are only just starting to come in. Uh, so that's why we, we have the evidence is starting to mount, but it's already at probable. And so I would say be cautious. Um, I don't believe, I don't think I can put it all out there in three to four minutes, and I don't expect you to necessarily believe me, and I love to share um, research from the experts on this, but um, the risks to children are really a concern of mine. I think you should locate cell towers away from um, schools and away from family neighborhoods, um, cell phones uh, and cell tower radiation penetrates children's skulls. Uh, they're more susceptible to that kind of um, effect. And there are distances that are safe. Um, this is just a diagram of sort of how the, um, the physics of a, a radiation of a tower. And most of the studies talk about a half mile to a mile. Um, it's very difficult to tell because it depends on is there cement, is there metal, is it how tall is the tower? How you know it's a lot of physics involved. So there's no direct, um, specific recommended distance from say, you know, a school. But I will tell you that um, we should be smart about our locating um, because we are taking a risk when we when we increase our coverage. And I don't. I think probably people are going to be really excited to increase their coverage, but I think they need to understand that there is a risk of increase in cancer also with that. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Foley Ferguson. Good evening. My name is Elisa Boxer, and my family and I are at 16 Minuteman Drive. That is in the Pleasant Hill neighborhood. And one of the reasons we actually chose that particular house is because the closest cell phone tower is a half a mile away. I am one of those people who 
I actually looked it up. Um, for years I've been collecting data on microwave radiation, and half a mile is really the generally, as Sue said, the generally acknowledged safe distance from a tower, especially for children. Um, as you consider loosening the restrictions on the placement of cell, cell towers, I'm here to ask you to strongly consider placing any new towers at least a half a mile from family neighborhoods like ours. Uh, my request comes for the same reason the Los Angeles Board of Education banned cell towers near schools. And actually, I have packets for you, so I'd like to get those too. Um, they said they wanted to, quote, ensure the health and safety of our students, the Los Angeles Board of Education. So I've enclosed a copy of that press release, um, which also refers to other states banning cell towers near school, schools because of cancer clusters, all very well documented, uh, peer-reviewed, published studies. I'm also endorsing a strong position paper from the International Association of Firefighters um, opposing cell towers on fire stations because of the dangers to human health. In fact, every study ever done on people living within a quarter to a half mile of cell towers uh, shows significant biological harm, including everything from insomnia to fatigue to hyperactivity to heart palpitations to definitely cancer. I mean, cancer, cancer is a big one, and the cancer clusters, again, are the, the disease that's very well documented. Um, the link to childhood leukemia, again, especially well documented. And I'm also enclosing a letter from my fiance, who is an attorney who's concerned about the health impacts of cell towers, but also concerned about the zoning changes being fast-tracked without the opportunity along the way for public input. We think that's really important, um, just not to rush this. So I understand that people like their strong cell phone signals. Honestly, I do too. Um, it's a pain sometimes not to have a strong signal, but not at the cost of living in a sick neighborhood and not at the cost of being in a cancer cluster, which are scientifically proven common occurrences if you live close to a cell phone tower. So I strongly encourage you to take your time and to look at all the research and to reconsider the zoning changes and instead consider requirements to keep any new towers in industrial areas, um, or at least in rural areas, a safe distance away from family neighborhoods, and that is the key. You know, places where children sleep, really, really important to have a safe haven. So thank you, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions, either now or later by email or phone. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Ms. Boxer. So can I give you these sure. packets? Okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kelly Bowden. I'm an attorney at Verrill Dana, and um, in full disclosure, I represent Verizon Wireless, and we've been involved in um, discussions with the town council and with the planner for now over a year. So I guess to the first point on process, I want to actually really commend um, the town of Scarborough. We first came in, I don't know, uh, probably was about this time last year, maybe earlier, um, talking about sort of an archaic restrictive type ordinance and that there weren't too many places to look for um, increased coverage, which was both cellular but also was actually being largely driven now by um, data demands. So um, as Verizon Wireless would tell you, Facebook has both been great and, um, had, and also increased needs for new um, towers and antennas in locations. Scarborough also needs increased um, voice and cellular uh, capacity. 
so we began discussions about um, sort of the best way to go about that, and um, Dan and the Ordinance Committee took it on um, to have independent review and input, and there have been open meetings throughout the year as there were sort of milestones, the first public meeting um, with the Council at the last, I can't remember the date, but a few weeks ago. Um, so there have been opportunities. There will be more tonight and on the 16th, I believe, um, as it's scheduled now. I'm not sure if that will change. Um, the other thing I just wanted to talk about a little bit is uh, how cellular uh, towers are regulated. And it's an interesting dynamic from someone who does local and state land use permitting. Um, it's a quasi-federal preempted activity. So what that means is Congress said we want local boards to have control over where these things go, but they don't have exclusive control. So there are some things that can be regulated, um, and there are some things that can't. And the clearest of these items that can't be regulated by local uh, boards is RF effects. Things can't, um, the radio frequency and health effects. It's expressly preempted by federal law, and even if you have a million great reasons why you're going to strike down an application that comes before you, or a, you know, a zoning proposal now, if it includes a health effect component, it will be overturned. Um, it's a pretty harsh rule. Courts have actually not sent things back to the boards. They've just ordered um, permits and build orders. And it's because there's a lot of misinformation. There's good information, there's misinformation. Um, and I should qualify this by saying um, you can't regulate it, but we do have to show that we meet federal regulations on health effects. And that is part of every permitting process that we do. Um, we're happy to provide all the evidence about how we comply with the federal regulations, but on this health topic, the federal regulations um, supersede the local. So in terms of locations and setbacks and normal land use planning, that all still remains. Um, there's a couple other preemptive ones that don't usually come up as often. This one tends to, and for obvious reasons. So um, just in terms of a framework, I wanted to throw that out there. Happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Bowden. By the way, if you would, please, we didn't quite get your name. If, if we could, please. Sure. It's Bowden, B-O-D-E-N. Kelly. First name. First name. Kelly. Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Thank you very much, Chair and members of the Planning Board. My name is Barry Hobbins. I'm an attorney from SOCO. And I'm here on behalf of AT&T Wireless. Uh, I want to first of all com um, commend the Ordinance Committee and the work of uh, Dan Bacon. I think the, the town of Scarborough has done the appropriate um, due diligence process and transparency process by retaining independent, an independent uh, entity to review the, not only the ordinance, but also review the issues of radio frequency, the issues of uh, coverage, um, which is consistent with the licensing provisions of um, carriers such as Verizon, which Ms. Bowden represents and who I represent, AT&T. Uh, I have uh, been involved in the permitting process of one of the earlier uh, attorneys that were, was involved, and I was involved early on during the process of developing the initial ordinance here in the in the town of Scarborough. Um, I permitted um, many of the sites, um, which turned out to be, um, at the time, uh, consistent with the ordinances of this community with respect to a hundred foot, uh, hundred foot in height ordinance, which uh, affected. Uh, and probably frustrated the process of co-location here in this community, and which has led to significant um, coverage gaps by carriers such as Verizon, carriers such as AT&T uh, Mobility. Uh, I understand and I have the highest respect for the um, dedication and sincerity of, of Suzanne Foley Ferguson and Eliza Boxer. I have been involved um, in another forum involving both of these individuals, and I can tell you they are speaking they are speaking um, um, sincerely from their heart. There's no ulterior motive. There's no special agenda, and we just happen to disagree respectfully with respect to the issues of radio frequency and whether or not if this 
if this community passed an ordinance um, that was restrictive and consistent with what their issues which they raised could put the, the town of Scarborough in a very compromising position with respect to violating uh, not only the principles of the Telecommunications Act of 1996, but also significant court cases which have all sustained the issue that a site cannot be turned down if they meet the FCC regulations and requirements and standards of radio frequency and health issues. And so I would, I know that those issues are very important, but I, in my process and in, in the 20 years I've been doing this um, type of work, I've uh, been able to uh, cite uh, wireless telecommunications facilities on stealth uh, uh, locations, ironically, uh, church steeples, uh, assisted care facilities, uh, which which have antennas on their building. Just recently, a facility in Biddeford, Maine, which was, went through the contract zone process, took seven and a half months uh, to go through what looks like a simple process, but was a, a process that was fully fully vetted and Obviously, those issues which have been raised here were raised uh, in that permitting process. Same is true with, uh, I don't know if you know, the, uh, uh, the UCC Church in Cumberland Center, right in the middle of Cumberland. Uh, that particular situation involved uh, the utilization of the historic society, the church, uh, the church itself, in essentially taking the dry rotted uh, steeple off the church and inserting it with something that was consistent was consistent with both the, the uh, historical preservation act the NEPA violate the NEPA proposals of the um, NEPA provisions when it comes to historical preservation and basically put, put on top of the uh, steeple um, a stealth application where the antennas were hidden um, you know in the church steeple and in fact the uh, equipment shelter was isolated in the basement uh, of that church for two carriers. Those are some examples of if there were significant health issues involved. Uh, first of all, liability insurance would not have allowed that to happen. Secondly, the carriers, as a matter of public policy, uh, would not allow that to happen. And, and thirdly, is that what you read on the internet is not consistent with what the studies have shown and what the law is. Not only the Telecommunications Act, FCC regulations and, and provisions, but also in case law. So I just wanted to address those issues, showing no disrespect for the individuals who have spoke to, who are both very capable individuals. We just have a difference of opinion when it comes to those issues. I'm not telling you that you should not weigh those issues with, through legal counsel of your community with what the law is in the state and what the law is in the, with the federal government and with the provisions of the Telecommunications Act. I think that will, I think, hopefully, you know, convey to you that this issue has, is still, still being discussed. It's an ongoing process, but it shouldn't be used as a, as a means of frustrating the intention of the Telecommunications Act, the idea of providing uh, a different type of process uh, now because of the needs and, and uh, the energies that have been put into developing data transfer and the like. It's no longer a green button and a red button on a cell phone. It is a matter of uh, economic viability to communities, public safety issues involved uh, with with uh, police departments and fire departments, uh, the idea of medical medical telecommunications w with physicians u utilizing the data transfer operations of a wireless network. So there's a lot of issues that you should look at. I believe this community has finally, with good due diligence, stepped to the plate and has developed an ordinance that will, I think, provide some uh, future some future uh, development, but also uh, is prudent in the approach that it's taken.
So with that, I'll, I'll say thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, um, I know that I, I speak for both of us who are here and other carriers. We'd be more than happy to provide you with any type of case law, uh, work with your uh, legal counsel uh, to make sure this ordinance uh, is consistent with federal and state law. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hobbins. Let me see if there's anybody else first. <clears throat> anybody else like to speak on this item? Mr. Chair, before she goes back to the podium, I'd like to ask Ms. Bowden, can you just clarify what the act is? You, uh, you, it went by me too quickly to grasp what we can and can't do from a, from a legal point of view. Sure, and I... Um, Does it mean, I guess I'll simplify things. Does it mean that if, if we go ahead with this, that, that if we say that in Area A it can happen, and somebody wants to put it in Area A, that we would be overridden? Well, that sort of speaks to a different issue. It's the, so it's the Telecommunications Act of 1996, um, and there's, towns basically can't have such a prescriptive ordinance that it would have the effect of precluding a carrier from coming in and having a right to put a tower somewhere. So you could certainly isolate a particular area that might not run afoul of it. It would depend on what else is going on around it, um, existing coverage, that kind of thing. So I can't say for certain yes or no on that topic. What I am saying is that the clearest cut item is if you zone for an area because of perceived health effects, that runs squarely afoul of the act and case law. So it can't be um, we think there's health effects within X feet of this place. I mean, that, that just, that is, is pretty clear in both the act and case law. Can I ask you, or Barry, because you've been around this subject in many areas, have there been uh, experts or scientists that have spoken in, in your presence about health hazards, and what have you heard, I mean, I, in, in generally speaking? Um, that's a very fair question. Yes, I have, uh, I have uh, heard personal uh, representations made by individuals who have represented themselves as experts. Uh, but what I can tell you is that, is that, that again, it's the idea of someone's opinion, whether or not it's scientifically based, it appears not to have met the threshold of the FCC and also the issues of the idea of public safety issues or health issues involved um, have not been have not been based on science. I'm talking that's been accepted by by the FDA, by the FCC, by other agent by other agencies, uh, by with cancer studies and the like by uh, the American Cancer Cancer Institute. But having said all of that, you understand there are those who strongly believe that a wireless carrier, a wireless tower, is going to cause some type of significant issue to them. And I've seen that in my in my business as a, an attorney developing um, sites for different carriers. And people have those emotions, and I respect the, I respect that. But we have to be a a government and a process of based upon science, based upon scientific uh, protocol, and based upon the rule of law as has been presented to the court system. Now, you've been up in Augusta a long time. Yes. What's the sentiment up there about this subject? Has it come up there at all, or is it yes, left to the individual communities? Well, can again, I, I again can from. I, can I ask one thing yes. first here? I, I'm not. I'm a little uncomfortable with the question and yes. answer since we're not in a discussion period. Okay. This is public hearing. Well, I'm just trying to get educated. I, I get that, but I, I think I, I, we should I do it at a you. different point, okay. if you will. That, that's fine. Can I, I, first of all, I, I, concur, I concur with you that that might be an appropriate question to be addressed through the chair to, uh, to someone in the audience, whether it's me or someone, or right. someone opposed. All right. So, in... Fine, thank you, and I'll ask you to sit for a second. Thank you. Ms. Foley-Ferguson, I will allow 
you to come briefly and once. Okay. So I just want to point out to you that <clears throat> you have two attorneys from two wireless carriers. If you want to get straight information from experts, you've got to go to someone who doesn't have a financial interest in it. I'm going to leave it at that for that one. What they have said about the 1996 Telecommunications Act, I would not disagree with. That's why I'm here, because now is your chance through zoning to only allow cell towers in places where they're appropriate. Right now, they're in the industrial zone, and we are not in violation of the 1996 Telecommunications Act. In fact, if you decide that our comprehensive plan does uh, is it does won't um, does not allow for the um, telecommunications towers to be put into residential areas. That is enough. It doesn't violate the 1996 Telecommunications Act. What she's saying, and what you have to be real clear about, and I urge you to contact your attorney about it, is that once you make a change and it is an allowed use, then you can't argue health. So if you make the changes now, and then health issues come up later, there could be problems. And I don't think Barry or the other woman would argue with that. Right now we're in compliance. We allow the carriers. We have coverage. Yes, there's some dead zones. I'm proud of my dead zones. <laughs> <laughs> um, but And there's issues, and we can definitely put some more towers in there. What I'm saying is to just blanket the town with unlimited towers without any consideration of where they might be appropriate via the comprehensive plan, via residential areas, via children, is not responsible. And again, I wouldn't go to people whose vested interest is financial to get the answers there. I, I'll pass, I, I'll give you one I have so much information, but I didn't want to overwhelm. This is one study from Blake Levin and Henry Lay that reviews all, uh, a lot of cell phone studies. So they went and they reviewed a lot of studies, and it talks about, but, and it gives all kinds of references, and I can email this to you guys. But you're making a choice now as to what zones to increase um, to allow a cell tower. So now is the time you want to um, make your decisions. Later on, you could run into that problem that they were talking about, which is health effects. This is my last chance, I guess. If they start saying things about me, I think I should be able to um, respond. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional comments? Right, seeing now I'll close the public hearing and I'll turn the issue over to the board. Mr. Mazur, you were in the yes. middle of it? Yep, I'll stay in the middle of it too. Um, I agree with some of the sentiments, okay? Uh, first of all, maybe public information, uh, informing the public we should do a better job in this particular issue. It is a major issue. I agree with that. I also am in agreement of the maybe we have to take a look at the limits of the number of towers. Uh, you know, in the half mile, I don't know. Uh, I have a scientific background myself. And uh, I'm not going to jump on just hearing from anybody uh, that one report or two reports uh, the gospel. Uh, that's why I'm asking the questions that I'm asking. Uh, and as far as, uh, uh, it's just of interest to me, sometimes everybody has their own agenda. Uh, I, I was amazed, you know, about informing the public. <clears throat> the first information I had as a resident of Scarborough about the $2 million was I was something I read in the, in, in the paper. And as a resident of Scarborough, I would have liked to have known about that, to have my input on that particular issue. So, uh, you know, it, it, it runs many different directions is what I'm trying to say. Um, my own personal feeling right now is I would have uh, no problem in, in reading more. Uh, I am a skeptic because I, I have feel that if the, if the health issues were as great as we're being told, uh, 
that entities would have put some end to this uh, uh, or limits on it, and I uh, I have not heard that. And uh, maybe it does exist. I'm not talking about locations of towers now. I'm talking about limits on, on any sort of uh, radio waves. Uh, so I, I would be willing to uh, uh, step back uh, momentarily uh, to uh, do some more uh, investigation, reading, uh, uh, before making a decision as to uh, zoning change. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mazur. Mr. DuPont. <coughs> yes, I'm going to have to agree with Ron, which I don't necessarily all the time. I think we need to take a look at this, mainly just by some of the close neighborhoods. Uh, there's certainly plenty of area on this map that we're looking at that we can put some towers. Um, I'll give the committee a lot of credit for all the time they put into this, but I think we need to look at it just a little bit more. Uh, as far as excessive towers, AT&T and Verizon are here. They're not going to build excess towers. They're going to co-locate if they can. It's just a matter of economics. So it's not going to be a number of towers. I think we need to kind of look at this a little bit closer. There's still some planning board stuff in there that we can stop some of these towers, but I think we ought to look at the zones a little closer. Thank you. Corey? Thanks. Uh, I think uh, John's last point was a, was a good one, and as good as any to start with, which is that um, as is always the case when we're considering or when we're being asked to give an advisory opinion on a vision to <coughs> zoning, it's not, it's not the, uh, our last bite at the apple as a planning board and that there will be opportunities for us to review things on a case-by-case -case basis. It's also not the community's last bite at the apple because this is just an advisory opinion that we're giving. We're not the body that's, that changes zoning in Scarborough. Um, we're just part of the process, and so there certainly will be more opportunity to be heard, and um, the council and others, will, I'm sure, will we'll hear from, from those who are concerned. Um, you know, I guess another general point I would make is that you know, when, when we all walked in here 45 minutes ago, most of us didn't know very much about radio transmission. Um, I think most of us have a general idea of some of the literature and the debate that's gone on around it, but 45 minutes later, I think it's fair to say that we're not experts on this, <laughs> and we're not going to sit here and and um, and presume to to rule on that, so to speak. So um, while I do appreciate some of the concerns, and as someone with a young family, I would have some of the same ones. Um, I do, at a certain point, have to defer to other experts who have been involved with this, including the independent expert who's been working with the town, uh, may be a fair point that it could have been better publicized. I'm not privy to exactly how that process has gone. Um, but just as a general point, anyone who's concerned about these types of issues or other issues should really be in the habit of checking the town's website and, and sort of seeing what's going on uh, with the council and other, other bodies. Um, and going forward, I would certainly recommend that in this case. In terms of the dimensional uh, and other, <coughs> other elements of the, the proposal, um, I don't have any particular issues. I'd certainly encourage the, the committee and the council to, to continue to take a close look at proximity and um, within the bounds of what is appropriate, look at whether it might make sense to, to uh, impose some limitations, uh, but again, I'm not in a position to opine about the, the health risks. Uh, so I hope that the, uh, the committee will continue to exercise due diligence, and um, again, there'll be other opportunities for this to be discussed. So when I was listening to Mr. Mazur and Mr. DuPont, I definitely heard that they would like to see more time put into this before any decisions are made. After listening to your comments, I appreciate your comments, but I guess I'm going to put you on the spot. Since we have to make a recommendation to the council on this item, um, can you give me a little bit more of whether you think this should go to the council as it is, 
Are you not happy with where it is? I just I wasn't sure I got where you were. I'm I, I'm I'm have an apprehension about the the making sure the wording on the limit of the number of towers. I I really I, I do, do have an issue with that, um, and. I would also agree with the, uh, our, for me, the recommendation would be to keep the towers away from uh, schools and densely populated neighborhoods. All right. I appreciate I, the very specific thanks, Ron. That I would. Yep. They, that's basically what I was trying to say. I think there's some <coughs> neighborhoods that we can move these towers away from. Right. Exclude from this zone. Right. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying I think that in our recommendation to the council, I think we need to be very clear as to our feelings in terms of um, whether we think this should be a blanket approach or not, because basically this is more or less a blanket approach to where towers can be located as written, or at least as I see it. That's the way I see it, too. So that's why I want to make sure that we give clear direction as to how this board feels to the council one way or another. So I, I, and I, I, would, I would agree with that recommendation. Um, my personal feeling is I hope that we don't move toward more of a contract zone type approach because that has all its own hazards uh, and points. But in terms of a recommendation, I would agree with the fellow board members have spoken so far. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Buffard. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to speak to the need for more towers. I live in that big gray zone up there, <laughs> and I can assure you uh, we could use better coverage up there. Uh, when I worked for the town about 10 years ago, uh, when I worked in the assessing office, I created a GIS map showing the number of new home permits by year for a five-year period. And the fastest growing part of Scarborough at that time was within a mile of the intersection of Holmes Road and Broad Turn Road, right, right in that gray area. Uh, <clears throat> Scarborough has grown tremendously, as we all know, and, and especially in the rural area. Uh, and there is definitely a need for better coverage in that area. Um, as far as the number of towers <clears throat> and the location of these towers, I would leave that up to the experts to decide. Um, and, but I do like the idea of co-location. Uh, I, think, I think it's long overdue, and they should have done that from the very beginning. Thank you, Dick. Yep. Mr. McGee. Yeah, I mean, I have, I probably have some more technical questions about some of this. I mean, I, I guess I'm unclear as to what what a cell tower provides for coverage. Uh, you know, a 100-foot cell tower right now, what does it provide? Is it a half-mile radius from that? We Is where you can get a cell signal and where you can run data? I guess I'm confused about how many, how many cell towers it actually takes to cover Scarborough. Um, if you extend it to 150 feet, what's the benefit? I mean, if we have existing locations that change from 100 feet to 150 feet, um, what's what change? What's the range change? Is, does it help the situation? I, I don't have enough information, is what I'm saying at this point, to to say I'm comfortable making the changes that are proposed, considering that we're now talking about three, you know, the industrial region to opening up cell towers to the entire town. I mean, there's nothing left unshaded in this, and that's that's problematic from my point of view. The second comment I would make about it is, I know there's there seems to be a, an outward concern in general, whether there's science behind it or not, to protect school children in schools. Well, which part of our population are we willing to damn if, if we believe there's a serious health effect? I mean, just the old people? Should we put them near old people homes? Hey, this is This is my point. You know, if you're worried about the kids, why aren't we worried about the old people? You know, it's, you know, if you don't want it a half mile from your own home, you know, we shouldn't be sticking it a half mile from somebody else. You know, that's, 
That's my general view of this. So I am not, I don't know if I was clear, uh, very comfortable with this proposal. The answer is yes, I think you are. <laughs> clear. Clear. It was, it was, it was clear. Yes, it was clear and concise. <laughs> Thanks, Nancy. Yes. Ms. Ogle? I'm not going to be clear and concise because I'm very confused. I have to agree that there hasn't been much said or done about this, but then again, that's not the way. No one is. No one in the town is being paid to call me up and tell me to be aware of things. It's on the website anytime anybody wants to check what, what the issues are that are coming up in front of the various boards at various times. And you know, I mean, I've served around the town enough to know that. There's just no way you can do it. Somebody's going to be on vacation or whatever, and you're just not going to be able to do it. But still, having said that, I'm glad that we have an opportunity to give some input to the council because I think this is an imperfect ordinance. I didn't really expect it would be perfect, but I definitely think it's an imperfect ordinance, and I would like to send recommendations that certain things be looked at again and that we have another chance to review a... Um, amended ordinance as opposed to just taking this one and making a few changes at the council level and voting on it. I'm not even sure that's possible. Is it according to our to our staff? Can they do that? They can bring it up and decide to take it back to the ordinance committee for further review? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the process after tonight is a public hearing on July 16th, that's the next town council meeting. Right. That's their public hearing. And from that meeting, they can decide to move forward with second reading, which would be the approval of right. what's proposed, or they could decide to have the ordinance committee work further on it, or Thank they could you. decide to, as a, or, as a council, the whole council could work further on it. That, so would that I would like to be my recommendation that after the public hearing at the council level that it be referred back to the ordinance committee to take a look at some of these things that we're the ones that are going to be implementing this, you know, and that's why we get a chance to look at it before an actual vote is taken. And I'm not very comfortable with exactly how that would work. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand how many towers we need either. How many towers do we need in order to cover Scarborough? I don't think that's going to come to us as a board do we need this tower? Um, we're going to expect that the people who are asking for use of a tower are going to do the homework and the investigation and the research and figure out where they need to have a tower. And there's going to be more than one person using that tower. So I think it'll probably work itself out. But the question is, should there be some consideration given to no more than? Probably not, but I think it's a good question. Um, where to put them? I've served on the committee that designed the comprehensive plan, I served on the committee that implemented the comprehensive plan, and the comprehensive plan very clearly talks about view corridors. So all this stuff about, zone, uh, about buffering between a cell tower and houses that are around is wonderful, and I think it's well done and it's clearly stated, but it doesn't take care of view corridors. We have a lot of them. I, I just can't imagine driving down Spurwink with the ocean on one side and, and the marsh on the other side with cell towers. So that brings me to, well, can you camouflage them? Now, I'm not sure whether it was the chair or I guess it had to have been our um, town planner who in his introduction talked about um, the, the, the um, planning board is going to get a chance to talk about aesthetics and buffering and camouflaging, and I don't know where that is in here. I've looked for it, and I don't really see where it is in here. It does say on page 3, Camouflaging treatment, in other words, uh, um, well, this vegetative screening, proposed color, or camouflaging treatment for the tower. But that it doesn't talk enough in here about giving us strong tools to use in um, buffering, not buffering, in camouflaging. In other words, 150-foot tower. How in heaven's name are you going to camouflage that so that when you're riding down Spurwink Avenue, you don't see it? This is a huge question for me. I have nothing against towers. Let me rephrase that. I have a lot against towers. I don't have anything against being able to get better cell, 
service than I do. I have to take my cell phone and go out and stand at the corner of my driveway in Black Point Road to get a dial tone. So, you know, I'm one of those people who's underserved. But I don't live here in Scarborough for the best cell coverage. I live here in Scarborough because it's still a fairly rural community, and it has some great, lovely things going for it, and I don't want cell towers all over the place. But I don't think that the the power or the opportunity that, this, that the um, planning board is being given here is clear. Uh, for example, on page two, it talks about um, towers having lights shall not be artificially lighted unless required by the FAA. What does that mean? What does the FAA require? Um, is it going to require something more than a hundred? Well, no, certain certain, certain heights height and stuff are for planes. Yes, but you got a hundred and fifty foot. But, but for planes or private. I understand that, but it says a hundred and fifty foot tower. Well, if you put a hundred and fifty foot tower on a three hundred foot hill, now you got a honking tower up there, and that would have to be lit. Okay, this is not clear in here. The implications of all of this in terms of trying to trying to um, be a conscientious member of the of the uh, planning board. Um, there was another one I was going to mention. Oh, I'm also confused about uh, the telecommunication facilities. The ZBA is going to have the uh, opportunity to issue a special exemption, but then does it come back to the planning board for all the rest of this stuff? I assume it does. No. No. The under the telecommunication facility component, that's where a tower, excuse me, antennas yeah. can be attached to a building. Right. The proposal by the ordinance committee is that for attachments to buildings that the planning board customarily reviews, which would be commercial buildings, um, the planning board would be the only reviewer because you look at architecture and design. Right. But for, for buildings that the planning board wouldn't typically look at, like, um, a, a perhaps a church steeple or a, um, a tall house or some other structure in a residential zone that the board doesn't look at, the zoning board is the review, is proposed to be the review board. For the I disagree with that. Okay, I disagree with that. And that is not something that I expect to win that process, but I disagree with that. And I think basically what I'm saying is that I would really like to recommend that this go back to the to the ordinance committee for some closer examination. And any, if, if we know when it is and they would like to hear more from the planning board as to the specifics, that would be fine. I mean, I would be very happy to go to an ordinance committee and discuss this in a little more depth. Thank you, Susan. Mr. Bacon, you have a few comments? I, I did have some feedback on the question about the number of towers that would provide strong, good service in the community um, in the areas that have poor coverage. And I can distribute to the board um, after the meeting tomorrow the assessment done by the consultant. The consultant actually not only generated the map that you saw earlier that shows existing coverage or lack thereof, um, but he also performed uh, a study or analysis as to where the ideal places, if you're worried about coverage, where the ideal places um, towers could go, considering installations on town property, because um, at one point the council was focused on, if we're going to do this, um, should we allow for them on town property and, and have some revenue from the lease uh, arrangements that often exist with uh, providers and tower companies. So that mapping I can provide you, um, it's, I would say, seven to nine new towers would provide, I think, very good service in the community um, to the areas that are lacking. Um, that's not to say seven or nine towers is necessarily going to be proposed and approved by the town, but that's sort of going from today to, say, optimal coverage. Um, and you can look at that map when I send it along to, to the board members. All right, I have uh, several comments as well. One of the things I would like to say is we did receive um, uh, email or, or a letter from one of our um, townspeople uh, that I'd like to at least uh, have 
individual's name in the record as sending something to the planning board. I apologize in advance. I will never get this name right. I'll give it my best. It's Julius C.M. Bronowitz. Is I, not bad. Okay. Um, is uh, information that we did receive, and I do want that for record purposes that uh, that we had it um, and considered it as part of our public hearing. Um, <clears throat> I have several things. Um, to one of the comments that was made about, and it was actually something that I had written down that the planning board needed to approve future locations and. And I realize that the ordinance basically speaks to the issue that it would come back in front of the planning board. I guess one of my concerns about this particular um, draft, the way that it's written, is that it's asking us to look at changing the ordinance, and I'll call it like carte blanche, across the town, which is where I have a concern. Um, Regardless of your personal feelings, whether you think it's a health issue, whether you think it's any other issue, I'm not, you know, whether it's a view corridor issue or regardless of what the issue is, um, my feeling is that if we say that this ordinance change as written is acceptable, then the only power that this board really has after the fact, it doesn't meet the rest of the ordinance. And if it does, we have no choice but to say it's going to be passed. It's not a personal issue. It has nothing, you know, the, play, the, the planning board, much unlike the town council, can get very personal. The town council can express their personal feelings, their personal attitudes, um, what they say, feel, and do, and what people talk to them about. This board does not have that liberty. Our power, if you want to call it that, is to enforce the ordinance as written. Okay? So my concern is that if we say this document is okay as it is, to me, leaves me not comfortable with what of any power this board may have in the future. I am also quite concerned that it contains language that says, for example, and I won't quote, but the gist of it is the tower does not need to be contained on the property itself that, that it, that's being set on. So in other words, if the tower is placed and there's an easement provided, this tower literally could be blown over and fall on somebody else's property, and I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. Um, so it, it's things like that that leave me wanting in terms of how I'm viewing this ordinance change. I do appreciate and totally understand that we need to do more to try to provide additional cell coverage um, for the people in town, and I am also in one of those areas that's kind of iffy, and, you know, if I want to stand on my left foot and put my right hand on the mirror and... You know, I can sometimes get coverage and sometimes I can't. Um, but having said that, I'm not willing to do it at any risk. So I, I would like to see what Mr. Bacon proposed earlier in terms of information regarding where potential sites would be that would provide good coverage so that if you make an ordinance change, you could literally look and see if the proposed locations have any other detrimental impact to the surrounding area and community. So I personally, and I won't go into everything I wrote down here, um, but I mean, it's, it's like everything from the number of towers to distances apart. I, I've got a bunch of stuff that I wrote down, but the reality of it is, I think it's a great idea. I just think it's a wine that's before it's time. I don't think it's quite ready yet. I think the Ordinance Committee still needs to uh, try to button it up a little bit, tighten it up so that it makes, I think, a little more, um, I'll call it environmental sense, and not just have it a broad brush 
um, saying that we can locate towers all over the place. That's my concern. So I, I, I think that we do have the technology today, and technology itself is somewhat interesting because tomorrow we could come out with a whole new microwave technology which changes everything, and towers that we thought needed, we needed here, there, and everywhere else may not be needed anymore. Um, so that always is going to be working in our favor um, in terms of trying to maximize the coverage and minimize the effects and the impacts. Um, <coughs> so I don't think it's ready. And if I, I I'm, I'm going to say that the recommendation that we need to be sending to the town council basically is please take this back to the Ordinance Committee, rework it. It's not quite ready. Um, and I think that there's a lot of things that we can still do to try to button it up and make it better. Having said that, I totally appreciate the effort that's already gone into it. Um, and um, I, I know that it's, this is not easy lifting. This is a lot of hard work. And it's important that we get it right the first time, if we can or as right as we can the first time. So uh, I know that that is not a unanimous opinion of the board, but I think it is a very strong feeling of the board in terms of um, the number of people who indicated that they might like this to go back to committee, be reworked a little bit. And I would ask our esteemed councilman in the back of the room if he would help carry that message to the council um, when they have an opportunity to talk about it again on the 16th. So that's my final comments other than this one thing. I do want to thank the public who spoke for speaking as eloquently as they did. And I also appreciate the fact that they tried to respect our time in the process. So I thank you for that. Any other board comments? OK. Got what we need? So, all right. Excellent. Our next item this evening, item number five, the Town of Scarborough requests an advisory opinion for a trailhead parking area on the Old Eastern Road. Mr. Bacon. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and it's a little unusual to have um, an applicant sitting with the board, but I actually happen to be one of the, <laughs> um, the, both the Planning Department, Public Works, and Community Services is working on this uh, effort, so. Um, would you like I'm to presenting. yourself, or? Well, I'm not a voting <laughs> member, so I don't need to. But uh, I just did want to indicate that the reason this is an advisory opinion is this is uh, a town effort, and under your site plan review ordinance, um, the planning board doesn't approve or deny uh, town projects, but you certainly provide your comments and your advisory opinion on them. Um, and for the benefit of the board and, and the public, um, this is the location of, uh, on the map above, is the location of a proposed small parking area at the eastern trailhead off of Black Point Road. It's the old eastern road coming down uh, by, east, by Eastern Village. So Eastern Village is the denser uh, neighborhood shown here. Um, eastern Road, Black Point Road is here. And this is where it transitions from roadway to the eastern trail. Um, as <coughs> Anyone knows who uses the Eastern Trail on weekends? This is a very busy location for parking um, and a pretty congested location. And so this is an initiative by the town to add some a modest amount of additional parking uh, down at this trailhead. This is an aerial that shows what used to be at this location. As some board members may remember, um, you did a site plan review some years ago for the sanitary district actually removing this pump station and putting a new pump station in a Winnix Neck. Um, so this is Sanitary District property. Um, this is what used to be here, was uh, one of their pump stations, and years before that it was actually a, a small treatment plant way back when. Um, so it's, it's owned by the Sanitary District. And uh, what exists today is sort of a, an old paved area um, that was parking and access for that old pump station. Um, and the sanitary district has agreed to allow the town to 
use this area for some additional trailhead parking. Um, it is close to the to the marsh, um, and therefore we need to be <coughs> sensitive in terms of where we're adding, you know, impervious area. Um, so this is what exists today, and this is what is proposed, um, and it's proposed to add about 10 parking spaces um, off of the old eastern to, to supplement the parking along the road there, which isn't ideal in terms of um, the way it's currently arranged, um, and it's proposing to add parking or you know, a gravel area away from the pond and away from the marsh, so it's not adding any impervious towards uh, the natural resources, ne natural resources nearby. And, and the proposal is also to remove some of the existing pavement that exists down there that's, that's really unnecessary at this time to keep the net amount of um, parking area or impervious area to be less than uh, the current situation. So this shows this existing pavement to be revegetated in exchange for some additional um, gravel area to add parking here. So uh, this is before you, like I said, for advisory opinion. And I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, we do have the opportunity for a public comment on this item. It is not a public hearing, but it does, we do offer the ability for the public to uh, comment on this item if they like to. If so, please approach the podium, much like the public hearing. You listen to any comments now? Okay. Seeing none, I'm going to turn it over to the board and go down to the other end of the table this time. Susan? I think it's brilliant. I just have a question, um, Dan. I know I asked you this, but as a result of reading it more closely now, I'm not sure I still understand. Well, <clears throat> the 10 parking spaces that will remain, or that will, that will be the final configuration here, is going to be gravel. That's the intention, is to start with gravel. There's not a much of a budget um, this year to implement this, so the idea is to add some much needed parking and to use gravel and there's no short term intentions to okay. paving it. Um I would like to suggest I have I think it's just great, but I'd like to suggest that there be something added to this that should the time come when for whatever reason they want to upgrade this from gravel to some other surface. I can't think of what it's called now. But if you go down Spurwink, just before you cross the river, on the left-hand side, that's the, the the fishing parking lot. It's porous pavement. Porous pavement. Isn't that something that you think I could remember? That <clears throat> we not just make it impervious surface, that we make it porous pavement because of, yeah, I mean, I know it's quite a ways back from the marsh, but <coughs> it's right there. Other than that, I think it's just a great idea. Right. Great. Thank you, Susan. <coughs> just real quick. <coughs> Um, trying to look at a longer-term projection, I, it's a popular, it's a popular area to go visit, and um, the extra spaces definitely would be welcome. I just wonder if it's, if it's n not something that we should consider. You know, why remove the existing pavement there and not allow? And I, I, kn I know you're talking about stormwater runoff and things like that. I just don't know what's the extra impact and would we violate anything. I, I just hate to have that all revegetate and then 10 years from now the town take up another proposal to expand parking in the area because it's popular. I, I, I just, I question whether or not we should, you know, why, why take out what's there? Um, the reason is that this whole parcel is in the resource protection zone, which doesn't allow any new parking. So the only the way the town can really do this under shoreland zoning is to not increase um, the amount of impervious area over what exists today. I very much agree with you. I think um, from a capacity standpoint, we wish we could put in 20 spaces or maybe 30 on this parcel because the demand is there and the current parking arrangement is not good. Um, but the resource protection zone really limits our ability to really do anything there. If there was no existing impervious area, we wouldn't be talking about parking at all here. Um, so we're, we're utilizing what we can here and 
kind of trading that impervious area and ripping it up and squaring up the parking area to, to make the 10. So, so 10 years from now, it, there's basically no room for expansion here unless we go through a, you know, a process to see an exemption or, I mean... Uh, the, we've been looking at that mm -hmm. um, and it seems like the opportunity for more parking along in this area mm -hmm. is along Old Eastern Road. So the other side of Old Eastern Road um, towards Eastern Village, um, long term there could be, or, or short term for that matter, there could be some potential if we can convince the current owner, which is Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, they actually own the Old Eastern Road in this area, um, that parking is needed. There could be a lot longer length of parallel parking along Old Eastern or other, another parking arrangement on the opposite, <coughs> side, opposite <coughs> side of the road. But anything on, on the, the south or the natu sort of natural resource side of the road is, is pretty much off limits given the, the zoning of that parcel. Thank you. That was it. That was it. Thanks, man. Dave? Well, I think it's a good idea. Uh, just a quick curious type question. Will the town plow this in the wintertime? We haven't gotten that far, um, but I can check with Public Works and, and see. I think it would be a good idea because people do use that in the wintertime. Good catch. Board? I also think it's a great idea. Um, in terms of the number of spaces and the demand, you know, while I, I know from first-hand experience that um, there is a lot of demand, I'm always a little wary of, of building parking for peak demand. <laughs> um, I know just just yesterday I was at the other, on the other side of the marsh at the uh, park that the parking lot that's just off Pine Point Road, which was literally overflowing, and people were parallel parking along the split rail fence there and everywhere else where they could find a few square inches. The other 300 days of the year, there's maybe one or two cars there. <laughs> so I say that as, as a heavy user of that particular part of the trail. Um, so I do think it's a great idea to, to provide this and to kind of make it a little less ad hoc, but I wouldn't lose too much sleep over um, not being able to, to build more. And I, I agree it's a good catch about the plowing because um, it's nice to be able to get in there and cross the trees and whatever else. Thanks. Yep. Thank you, Corey. John? Oh, I agree. It's a good idea. There's a couple of questions I've been done. Is the tank still there? Is the building still there? No. Those were taken out okay. um, two or three years ago. And as far as forest pavement, you and I can talk about that later on. I don't like that idea at all. <laughs> the maintenance issue is fine with the current owner, but across the street, Oak Hill, instead of the savings, get an owner 50 years from now, they're going to maintain that. Gosh, the bathroom, you can't use sand. That's just an issue of other day. Mm, yeah. Thank you, John. Ron? Yeah. <coughs> Let me say I'm, I'm in favor of it. Having said that, I live in Winnix Neck, and it's just going to bring more traffic. And it takes me a half an hour to get from Winnix Neck to Black Point Road. But having said that, uh, uh, I think it's a good idea. Thank you, sir. Uh, I also think that this is one of those great opportunities that come in front of us, and we definitely need to capture this. Um, the one comment that I have in regards to this, and again, as Nick had indicated, is 10 enough, and we kind of got the answer to that. Um, but the the other side of this to me is where the people park now. So anybody who travels uh, Black Point Road, and again, I live down Black Point Road, so I get the opportunity to do this more than once a day. Um, there are always cars parked right at the beginning of the Eastern Road on the corner of Eastern and Black Point Road. And um, as Eastern Village continues to develop, there's going to be more and more traffic uh, in that area. So my concern with this is that as we build that parking area, I think we need signage along Eastern Road in that area that says no parking. And if we have to direct them down to the parking area, we should do that. Um, I just think that we've got to start getting people into the habit that they don't want to be parking there because we're going to have, you know, a, 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 I think there's a little bit of a smaller roadway there or uh, sidewalks <laughs> and a few other things that are going to be along there. And 
Uh, it's just not going to be the super wide uh, gravel shoulder that's there now. So I think we need to just start getting people into the habit of using the parking space that's being proposed and directing them down there. Outside of that, I think uh, pretty overwhelmingly the board is in favor of this. Our next item this evening, Hospice of Southern Maine requests a site plan review for a 12,112 square foot building for a site at Route 1 and Lincoln Avenue. Mr. Bacon, when you are ready, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the board reviewed this a few times under plan development, um, and you approved their master plan some time ago. Um, and since then, Hospice has been through the uh, the peer review engineering process over the last um, couple months. Um, they have their DEP permitting and Army Corps permitting in hand at this point. Uh, they've been working at the state level with DEP. We have uh, staff comments uh, in your packages and as well as um, Water and current and civil engineering review comments and Goral Palmer traffic review comments. Um, so, at this point, under staff comments, I'll just provide a few introductory remarks and then turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Um, one point of review uh, between staff and the applicant um, that has come up is um, the necessity or or lack thereof of the right out um, proposed curb cut on Route 1. Um, that's been proposed. It wasn't provided in the master plan approval, um, so the board should look at uh, look at that and whether it's consistent with the master plan approval. Um, and in your site plan review ordinance, um, out of sort of access management policies are to, if there's a secondary road um, to provide ingress and egress to a site um, with a property on a corner lot or having frontage on two streets, it's preferable to provide full access onto the secondary road. So this project has full access on Lincoln. Um, and so staff questions the, the need for the, the <coughs> right out. Um, it can be a benefit to um, folks leaving the site for sure, um, but the town has had some um, <coughs> some issues with other right out onlys along Route 1 and improper use of them. Um, and so that's really one of the lead staff concerns with them is people attempting to take uh, left in to the right out only, uh, which occur to, occurs frequently at a neighboring parcel. So that's one reason we're bringing this up. <laughs> um, and so we encourage the board to, to discuss that with the applicant and see if. Uh, that's necessary at this point. Um, perhaps when the project gets larger, it might be uh, more warranted given, uh, you know, in a, in a future phase, if there's a lot more traffic generation from the site. Um, another item that I think the applicant has a, a way of addressing is uh, enabling future interconnections with neighboring properties. Um, there's the, the bowling alley next door. Um, right now it may not make sense to interconnect um, this site with that site given the current use of the, the neighboring site, but down the road that use could change and to uh, an attempt to keep you know, traffic off of Route 1 if it doesn't need to be on Route 1. There might be some value in providing a driveway connection um, in the future to that site to, to limit the use of Route 1. There could be some, some cross traffic there. I think the applicant has responded to a few of Jay's comments on um, access to some stormwater facilities uh, that were raised in the staff comments um, for having easy maintenance and, and access uh, to those facilities. Um, <coughs> and those updated plans came in today, as well as uh, an updated lighting plan in the staff comments we raised the. Uh, the idea of providing the board with a photometrics plan that shows you know, some variability to light levels in, in the evening um, to minimize impacts and to reduce lighting. I think that's been provided uh, recently by the applicant. And uh, I think a final comment is 
um, the town recently adopted some updated standards uh, and review process for historic preservation, historic landmarks and, and structures. Um, and the Historic Preservation Committee has been working for a number of months on, on a list of uh, locally significant historic landmarks and structures uh, that hasn't been approved by the council yet, but it's been the works for a number of months and is likely to go to the council uh, in September. Um, this is a site that formerly was the Danish village, um, which um, I think may have been the first motel in the country. I'll let the Historic Preservation Committee comment on that. There's a few remaining items that may or may not be salvageable, an arch and a fountain. Um, and we'd like to encourage a dialogue with the applicant about enabling an analysis as to whether they are savable um, or salvageable, whether to be used on site or, or off site. And if they aren't, which is a distinct possibility, um, seeing if there's a way to remember those features um, on site through a plaque or some other form of um, information, education for future users of this site. Uh, it has a fair amount of heritage for the community. So uh, with those introductory comments, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And at this point, I will turn it over to the applicant. Good evening. My name is Bill Hoffman uh, from FST, representing Hospice. Also uh, with us this evening, um, Dave Perkins, um, an attorney that's worked with uh, Hospice, and Charlie Rizza, the architect from Morris, uh, Switzer. It was last August that we came in for master plan approval. Uh, since that time, um, Three substantive changes have occurred. The first is um, the building size shrunk from 17,000 square feet to uh, just over 12,000. Uh, that's actually um, because of improved uh, efficiency of the building. It's not a reduction of uh, the hospice plan. Now, the second thing is there was concern <laughs> about um, when someone comes into um, the facility, uh, their ability to be able to drop someone off at the entrance and turn around and go back to Lincoln Street. Um, originally, they would have had to go up and back in the parking lot. That's been revised such that that's possible. You, you uh, can come in, there's a drop-off loop, and then you can turn left and go back to Lincoln Street. And then the third item, uh, which has been mentioned, is a, a request to um, have an exit out onto Route 1. Um, we have tried to make some changes to make that more palatable. Uh, we went from a 20-foot width to a 12-foot um, width. Um, and the reason for it is uh, simply a, a recommendation from the traffic uh, engineer, Bill Bray, um, that the right turnout would allow northbound traffic not to have to go through the signalized intersection. Uh, that um, intersection is, is fairly busy and um, expected to, to uh, uh, the traffic going through, they're expected to grow, so it was a recommendation for that purpose. We did um, 
we see some uh, final uh, town and peer review comments last week. Um, first uh, comments from Woodard Curran, I think those have been addressed in, in total. I don't think there's any um, outstanding issue on the Woodard uh, Curran uh, review. Um, Gold Palmer, uh, the issue again is the, um, the right turn out onto Route 1, uh, not having adequate uh, traffic um, for the project. Um, uh, usually you need 50 um, uh, turning movements. Uh, we have far less than that. Um, and then the, um, the third um, were the um, uh, town staff comments. And I believe those have been um, uh, addressed with uh, several um, exceptions. Uh, the first is uh, uh, the question about the Route 1 uh, exit only. Uh, the second is um, the um, question about um, whether there should be some landscaping or more landscaping at the Lincoln um, Avenue entrance. And then the third is the um, building architecture. Um, that's why uh, Charlie uh, Rizza is here. But I can tell you that hospice um, uh, has a care facility in, in Scarborough right now, and they intend the, the architecture to be uh, not identical, but um, um, uh, work with that or a similar appearance. And um, that can be reviewed in more more detail. <coughs> um, and it's uh, public utilities, on-site stormwater management. Um, uh, we've met with fire. We've met with the um, utilities. And um, I think here is our, uh, our last uh, step. We would request approval. Um, contingent on uh, decision on the Route 1 uh, exit, and also that the architecture you'll see tonight uh, is not a complete building design, but the architecture uh, remain consistent with what's presented tonight uh, based on staff review, um, and if so, uh, they uh, hospice would not need to return to uh, planning board. Um, so going to... Um, Unless you have questions right now, I would have Charlie uh, Rizza present the architecture. That's fine. Mm -hmm. oh, well, we'll have your, your presentation first. Charlie's doing this. Uh, Dave Perkins, I'm a board member. I'm also a lawyer, but my role really has been a board member on this. We have been talking to the Historic Committee, Craig Friedrichs and others. Uh, we're very open to working with the Historic Committee. I think some of the uh, fountains and the arches that they're talking about are where our footprint is. So we've already told them if anything wants to be moved. We're trying to preserve costs, so we don't want to incur costs, but we're totally flexible about having things moved and if there's uh, some joint effort to com com commemorate or to have plaques or things of that nature, we're, we'll be glad to work with them. Thank you. Are you going to project something? Yeah. I'll unplug mine. That's not it. <laughs> 
lovely. Yes, yes. Like that, though? <laughs> Very lovely. <laughs> we approve. We approve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. So like that? And just improve the view a little bit. <laughs> the cost to build that is going to be tremendous. Though. It's, uh, not much room up here. Choose duplicate. Yeah, duplicate the second option. Yeah, let me try that one. Okay, thank you. So I'm Charlie Rizzo with Morris Switzer Environments for Health. I manage our Portland, Maine office. And tonight I just wanted to give you an overview of our approach to building design, which will be for the site on the corner of Lincoln and Route 1. So um, to do that, I just want to back up just a little. I know you know the Gosnell Memorial Hospice House. And you know there was a lot of attention paid to that uh, structure on the neighborhood, fit into the neighborhood. And it began to address you know, a style of architecture which was complementary to that in Scarborough and that to the neighborhood. And so the project, you know, over the years has really felt very comfortable in the neighborhood. Uh, and the materials used were that more residential styling and uh, quality, which again complements not only the mission of hospice being a home-like environment for terminally ill patients, but also uh, works with the, uh, the, uh, the really the, the standards developed for Scarborough. And so you'll see a lot of forms in here that are very consistent, peaked roofs, the columns, uh, sort of a <coughs> projected dormers and uh, bays on the building, all of which you know, are very complementary to uh, the style of the neighborhood. So for the project for Center for Hospice, which is now going to be done for the Route 1 facility, uh, the interest of the client to maintain that, having that identity already established, is really important. It doesn't mean we will match it exactly. It means that we will complement the materials and colorations of the materials such that it becomes almost a branding in some way for hospice to have some identity. And uh, so therefore, what I just want to take you uh, briefly through is the, uh, the approach to this. So hospice, uh, the Center for Hospice, basically will have four key components. It has clinical services, bereavement, education, and administrative support. So that building has a variety of uses. And you can see the diagram here, um, Route 1 being to the top of the diagram. This is just a conceptual floor plan of the building. And uh, just so your understanding of how the building works, so Lincoln Avenue would be to the left, you know, quite a ways away, and then Route 1 to the upper side of the diagram. So when you come up on the access drive, uh, the first component is bereavement, volunteers. The entrance to the building for the public is in the center. And then immediately off of the arrival lobby is a uh, multitude of uh, meeting rooms, uh, flexible meeting space that is used by both the public 
for educational purposes and for staff as well, similarly. Um, also along the front will be a direct staff entrance, which is important because that's way it gives them closer access to the parking lot and ease of access coming in where at what point they will have access to the bathroom, lockers, and other support spaces. Much like the earlier plan that I showed at the master plan, the clinical space for most of your uh, uh, workers will be toward the back, towards the serene environment. Uh, again, this is for, because they spend the majority of their day sometimes in this location, and in other times they're in and out fairly quickly, but that has the largest component in the property. And then also with outdoor access uh, off of their kitchen area, out to a space where they can uh, have lunch. So uh, our approach to the building, therefore, if this is the view looking uh, a little closer up from Route 1, is to take some of those elements that we've talked about and incorporate them into a building, which has a series of one story, uh, but would likely have more of a one and a half story entry lobby and adjoining a base that represents that either the uh, bereavement center or for um, the conference center. Uh, the staff entrance is here in this particular view. The main entrance is this larger form in the center here. From Lincoln Avenue, you would actually approach the building this way, so it would be at a slight angle, north being up towards this side. Um, the uh, development office and areas would be into the front here. Then this would be the main entrance here. And just a close up of the uh, end of the building towards the staff entrance. So, the materials that you're seeing is a combination of materials. One thing that is on the Costell house right now is actually a vinyl product. So, uh, we would propose a cementitious fine material. Softer ranges, gray, or coats, something complementary to what's there. The siding, uh, full height of the disc, these are just colored panels of the product. But it's a, a long life uh, cementitious product that is, could be either smooth or rough textured in appearance. And then also is available also in <coughs> shingles as well. So we would likely use a combination of both shingles and uh, lap siding. And then the roofing, of course, would be complementary again to colors that you saw from there. They actually have a lighter roof, something in the brown, but again, you have an option of going with almost any color. This happens to be a 25 year roof. Uh, a lot of the analysis that will be done in the coming year or so will be looking at the cost of products, of course. Um, as you know, this project has to be fundraised for, and there's still some ways away from their goals. So, uh, there will be some time not only to continue working with the architecture and the planning, but as well to look at the cost of everything. And the back of the building, uh, likely going to be more of a flat roof in the back. Uh, also, that really will be hidden. And so the peaked roof to the front the side, um, the rooftop equipment will likely be used in this case, hidden away from the on that flatter roof, and that's one of the reasons for the flatter roof, because that's the clinical area that I mentioned where most of your daily staff would be located. That's a much larger area and much difficult to put a pitch roof on to the side. So a flatter roof would be more appropriate in that location. So that's the presentation. I'll take any questions if you'd like. We'll get to the board in a minute. Okay. Um, this item also offers an opportunity for the public to make public comment. If there's anybody here who would like to uh, offer up their opinion on this, what they've seen so far, please approach the podium at this time.
and Becky Delaware, um, Manson Libby Road, and I'd like to make a personal comment before I do my presentation. Uh, the right egress um, to me would be a big mistake. I come out of that intersection by Hygus uh, almost on a daily basis, and you would see some interesting driving decisions um, by that business that's right on the corner that does have right uh, egress. Uh, people trying to beat the light, uh, people trying to beat the people coming through the light, uh, making left-hand turns out of the right egress. You can't believe, unless you've been there, the driving decisions that are made out of that right egress. So it would be a lot safer for everybody if they went through the light. <laughs> Um, my decision, my presentation is for the Scarborough Historic Preservation Committee. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Danish Village. This is a, an artist rendering of it, and I do have some pictures. They're small. I can pass them around to you, or um, there's current ones, and there's when it was in its heyday, if, if you want me to pass them. I don't know. The Danish Village uh, was known Dendaski Lansby in Danish. It was built in the late 1920s by the Rhines family that owned the Eastland Hotel in Portland. Mr. Rhines was interested in Denmark, so he built a Danish village that replicated Reby, Denmark, where Hans Christian Andersen grew up. Hans Christian Andersen was a children's author. He wrote The Ugly Duckling and The Little Fir Tree, as well as other children's stories. The Danish village was the first motel on the East Coast. Uh, for a long time, we said in the country, um, we had somebody out in the Midwest <coughs> come and contest us. Um, so it's the one on the East Coast, the first on the East Coast. And one of the few places that would allow a Negro to stay there with his employer. Many of the other of the um, hotels in the area would not allow that. The Danish village in Scarborough consisted of a hundred little houses painted all different colors as well as a large dining hall, a fountain, and an arch. Mr. Rhines had all the workers dress in Danish costumes and we believe he may have imported the fabric from Denmark. In the 1930s, a photograph of this motel was a two-page spread in the National Geographic. During World War II, the government took this place over and it was housing for shipyard builders um, in South Portland. After the war, the Danish village, tr village tried to capture its business back, but it never gained the prosperity it had before the war. In the 1960s, it became the home of an al alcoholics reform group, but frequent fires were a problem for the place and the group moved. In the 1970s and 80s, the dining hall, the fountain, and the arch were all that remained. About the 1980s, the town had the dining hall burned because it was a public safety issue. The arch and the fountain still stand. The fountain is huge. It's probably 12 or 15 feet in diameter and is made of cement. It probably could not be moved. The statue of the Danish king that topped it is now gone. I'm told that it might be possible to rehab the fountain, but whether it could be operated as a fountain or not is questionable. But I can see the fountain as a centerpiece for an enclosed atrium where people could go to eat lunch or take a break. The brick arch is also in poor condition and would have to be re-cemented. Uh, most of the mortar is gone, so it's just bricks on bricks. But I think it could be moved and placed at the end of a walk at the entrance of the building and make a nice accent for the building. Danish Village was beautiful and it was a unique first for Scarborough as well as the East Coast. It would be wonderful if these two remaining pieces of architecture could be incorporated into, new, into the new Gosnell structure. If the owners feel that that would be impossible to save these, would they at least consider placing some kind of plaque or kiosk to mark the historic nature of this site? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Delaware. 
Anyone else? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to turn it over to the board at this point in time and ask Mr. Fellows to give us a whirl. All right, thank you. <coughs> um, I will start right off with the Route 1 access question. And um, I feel pretty strongly that it, I oppose that idea. Um, we always look for opportunities to access properties uh, through signalized intersections. We have here a perfect opportunity to do that. Um, I think we all have our own anecdotes about what we've seen along Route 1 <laughs> with people making, trying to make left turns in wherever they see an opening, even if it's been designed, often at the behest of prior boards to discourage that by the way that it's curved and so forth. People will, will do what they, what they want to do. Um, and it would also make me a little, I'd also be a little concerned about the proximity to the, to the intersection and people trying to keep the light and so forth. So I'm firmly uh, opposed to that. Um, in terms of the architecture, um, I think it, what we've seen, it looks good, it's <coughs> harmonious with, um, with uh, generally speaking, with our design standards and consistent with what's been built at the, the residential facility. Um, I would, I, I'm here, I've heard, I heard the rationale for having a mostly flat roof at the back. Um, I would still encourage the applicant and the architect to explore ways of um, mitigating that somewhat. I mean, we've, we've certainly had other buildings in town um, where we've had, there's been a lot of volume and um, been able to address that in different ways. Uh, I don't necessarily consider that a, a deal breaker, but I encourage the team to, to continue to look at that. I do have one uh, little question for, uh, on the architecture. Looking at the, the first elevation, it uh, shows up most clearly in that one anyway, at the, the left-hand side of the, the building, there's so it's sort of a um, mesh fencing screening there. Um, what is that screening? Is there other mechanicals there? Or because it doesn't appear to be in front of any of the other uh, shrubbery along the building. And I know that the plans aren't fully developed, and I'm just curious about whether that's intended to specifically screen something. Can I ask you to approach the podium, please? So to address the screening to the left, let me uh, go back to the bottom. So at this point, there needs to be some, uh, well, if you look at the actual section of the building to the left with the gable facing towards us, that is actually the utility building. Utility meaning support for services, and that's where mechanical would be. So the closest point to Route 1 where our power is coming in is at that end of the campus. Therefore, we've located the electrical room there, which puts our uh, transformer outside the building. We want to respect the conditions of that. Uh, and there's been discussion about a, um, a small generator, too, to keep the building you know, during power outages, still functioning. So again, uh, would be likely an exterior generator, and we're looking for an opportunity to screen that. Uh, it may be a more significant fence. You know, I do want to clarify one point in that this design is really reflective of the earlier one in the master plan, and uh, still needs refinement to shrink it back down to a size that would be appropriate that we will be using for the final building. Um, at this point, we haven't been yet authorized to move forward until there's a significant enough money raised for the building, with which point then we will move forward with the final design. But this is still reflective of the level of detail and quality that we're looking for. And the screening, you know, I, I want to respect the fact that we don't want to see those elements either, mm -hmm. but we need to recognize that there'll be some kind of screen to provide that uh, okay. protection. I, I thought that might be, be the case, and I appreciate the clarification and confirmation on that. Um, beyond that, in terms of the historic elements, um, I commend the applicant for their apparent efforts to to uh, to work with the preservation committee to to either somehow incorporate the elements that remain there, or if 
that's not feasible to some, something commemorating them, and I urge you to continue that. Um, it's a very interesting piece of history that I'm sure a lot of folks are not really aware of. Um, in terms of internal circulation, I would just add my voice to uh, staffs and others encouraging the applicant to consider having a future connection with the abutting use or the, the abutting site. Um, beyond that, I know there were some other sort of technical um, peer review type comments, but I look forward to seeing things develop further in terms of architecture and, and, um, and other components of the proposal. That's all I have. Thanks, Corey. John? Uh, I'd like Corey to go in first because then I really don't have much more to say. Thanks, Corey. <laughs> Uh, I agree on the curb cut, North Mound. I disagree with that entirely. I will not vote for that. Uh, and then that's basically it. I like the architecture um, and the efforts done. And just a few more things. If you get the attachment G, stormwater management, that's one thing I noticed with this. Um, just something obviously to make sure we deal with later on. Did the applicant update the submission on that? <coughs> I believe you did, correct? That was in one of the notes, and I didn't see it in our packet. There was a yes. Stormwater has been reviewed both by the town and by DEP. Uh, basically, it's uh, to provide both detention and water quality elements. Uh, the water quality elements have um, some filters between um, the uh, parking that parallels Route One. There's some proprietary units in back called um, Storm Street. Uh, there's some underground storage that um, holds um, water while it's regulated through the uh, proprietary uh, devices. And then for the last bit of detention, it's actually a dry detention pond uh, that floods in um, uh, major storms, not during the, um, the small storm events. Um, so that uh, portion of it um, uh, has been uh, been addressed. I'm basically talking about the attachment. We're looking at uh, Section 12, Attachment G, Stormwater Management Inspection Requirements. I don't have it in this packet. Just something I just will need to right. Yep. Hey, we have as we move forward. Yeah. They submitted some additional comments just this afternoon, so that's something I think that's easy for them to provide. Right. Thanks, John. Ron? Yeah. Um, I have a, uh, a, a general question because I've heard a couple of times that uh, they're way off from getting the amount of uh, capital to build this. Now, we approved this last August, right? Would would they then come before the board for an extension if if in fact they don't start building by August? No, they you approved their plan development master plan, so you didn't issue a final approval that okay. has uh, a clock that begins to tick that they need to get reapproval. Um, they're seeking site plan approval, which would be the final approval, and they would have a year to start or ask staff for an additional year if say fundraising doesn't meet their needs to begin within a year. So they really have two years to <coughs> commence construction from whenever you issue, issue gotcha. site plan approval. Thank you. Now, they've asked for a reduction in the square footage. Does that have any impact on this parking situation? They're showing some parking to be implemented now, and then they can add parking later if needed. So um, I think their parking numbers are consistent with or greater than their requirement under, under the current square footage of the building. So. Well, I guess there was some question in what I read about the amount of parking spaces that uh, they were requesting, uh, but you're saying that that's within... For on an earlier submission, they showed phased parking and there was some question about, you know, when it's triggered to build that second phase of parking. And they've updated their plans just to show the parking that they intend to to build with this new square footage, which is 
a bit reduced from their plan development approval back last early last fall. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. And then another question to staff. Um, the voluntary remedial action plan, because they, they said that there's going to be more than 10 cubic yards of material. Do they, they have to come before us? Do we have to give an exception to that? It's on the second page of their submission. Bill, do you mind commenting on that? It says, uh, <clears throat> because the voluntary remedial action plan is likely to involve more than 10 cubic yards of material, the applicant is requesting the planning board approve the work as part of the site plan review. Okay, that's sort of like the doing some excavation prior to a building permit or something like that. So Do we have to approve that, though? I think that gets approved if you're approving the site plan um, projects. I don't, that's not something you have to approve separately from this application. Okay. Um, I know I'm putting you through the ropes here, but this is just information that I need. Um, I'm also against the right-hand turn, but if I understood, Bill Bray said he he said to go ahead with it, didn't he? Or he, he did I understand that correctly? Did he recommend that there be a right-hand turn onto Route 1? Bill Bray is the applicant's traffic engineer, and he recommended, I think he found value in the right turn lane in terms of not adding additional traffic to the signalized intersection. So the board needs to kind of weigh the benefits of that with the concerns about using a right out only for other purposes than right out only, um, and sort of the hazards or perhaps safety concerns that go along with that. So that's. I think uh, I'm in, I'm in favor of just using Lincoln Ave uh, lights. Uh, the other thing I haven't heard anything about is, uh, and I, maybe it's too too premature, is uh, uh, what we're going to do about plants and and so forth and so on. And maybe it's too early in the game for. Mm -hmm. For that situation, I, I don't. I didn't see anything on there, and I don't have any sense of uh, what's going to what's going to go on as far as uh, that's concerned. So I would like landscaping and and buffering type situation. Um, I think uh, for the time being, that's all I have right now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good. Thank you, Ron. Just as an FYI, in the very back of the package, there's a landscaping plan. I I, I read it, but I still didn't. Yeah. Okay. It didn't really. Yeah, yeah. I went through it quickly, but I'd rather have seen something. I am more on. I got you. All right. Dave. Hey. Thank you. Uh, I do like the design, um, and I would encourage you to continue with that two-tone. Uh, Proposal. It helps, you know, with the building that long. It helps to break up the length of that building. Helps with the aesthetics. So <clears throat> uh, I'm I'm fine with that design. Um, like everyone else, um, I would like to see that right hand only exit to be uh, deleted from the plans. Uh, I agree that I I think it'd be sufficient to use Lincoln Avenue and and traffic lights. Um, I have a question about the parking. Uh, as it stands now, what, how many spaces are anticipated? Or, how many, or in other words, how many are proposed initially versus how many will be planned uh, ultimately? number of parking spaces, um, including drop-off where uh, you can stand, you can't uh, park and leave your vehicle, are um, there's six of those. There's 160. The plan is to build 128, defer 32 until later. And the rationale behind that is when they occupy the building initially, um, 
they won't be up to full um, occupancy at that time. Um, so it would just defer the um, uh, construction of those spaces, uh, stormwater. Um, that sort of thing has been designed into the plan for the, the complete um, um, build out. Um, well, how many people are anticipated to occupy that building? Um, what would full capacity be? I believe it's around uh, 60, I believe. Um, and what happens is um, uh, their current operations is um, they have people that work principally um, outside of the building. Um, almost like an on, on call, almost like itinerant in nature. But uh, there's at least once a week where uh, they come in for training and meetings like that, and that's what uh, helps drive their uh, parking demand up as, as high as it is. It's very unique that uh, they have that, that occasional uh, or weekly surge in, in required parking. Um, and that unique condition is actually one of the reasons they want to build build their own facility. Okay. Thank you. I'm all set. Thank you. Next? Um, I don't know if I missed it in the packet, but uh, is there a specific reason why there's the filling the wetlands at the north part of the property here? It's right on the border of the property, and it says to be proposed to be filled. I just didn't. I don't, I don't understand the impact to the rest of the project area. Wetland area 33. Uh, number three. Right. That yeah, that one. Yeah, that one. Is there a reason for that? I don't know if I missed it. Yes. Um, the reason is <coughs> that um, um, there's uh, some contaminated soil and ash from when the um, uh, Danish village was um, heated. They, they dumped uh, coal ash out there. And then when the uh, building was burning, there was more ash. Um, so uh, the plan is to uh, cover that with a uh, demarcation layer, almost like an orange uh, uh, snow fence or something like that. So if you dug through it, you you know you hit something special. And then cover that with loam, um, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, excavating it out and removing it. Uh, so it's, it's just for that purpose. Um. And as far as input, the right turn, I'm not in favor of the right turn on the Route 1 either. Um, and the architecture, I think, is, it looks nice. That's all I have. Thank you, Nick. Sue? I was not on the board when the um, original master plan. master plan came in, so you missed this part. So I'm going to say it now. I simply don't understand why the parking's in the front when the design standards, et cetera, were created, one of the primary things is that the buildings would come to the front, the parking would be in the rear. Someone said something to me about the fact, well, the applicant doesn't want people having to look out that building onto Route 1. So we're going to look out the building onto a massive parking lot. I don't quite see the difference. Um, looking at the site, Plate 2 site plan, it seems to me that if that office building did come forward and the parking did go in the back, it wouldn't take much to organize that so that the uh, concrete fountain could stay and the um, brick arch could stay. Other than that, I mean, I know it's not going to happen, but really, this is a nice site, and it's a nice building. Why can't we bring the building forward and just put that sea of parking in the back? The landscaping, by the way, the next time you come, would you be willing to take the landscaping plan and blow it up so that it's about this big, so we could actually, I can't even read what the letters are that tell me what the planting is going to be, <clears throat> especially along Route 1 is what I'm interested in. But if you're, if you're, where is the, what page is the landscaping plan? C5.0. C5. Does it show the um, landscaping in the parking area? 
I'm sorry, Susan? Does it show the uh, landscaping in the parking area? Yes, it does. Okay. So um, I would very much like to have, and I agree with my um, board member, other board members that I, I know you've got plan, but I can't read it. I can't understand it. So if you bring in something larger and easier to look at. Um, I definitely am not in favor of the Route 1 exit. I do believe what people will do. I see it happen all the time, and it's a disaster waiting to happen, and I'm quite frankly amazed that a traffic engineer would suggest that. So um, I don't think that that needs to happen. I think that other than that, everything has been has been mentioned. Um, oh, we haven't seen any signage. At some point, we're going to see signage, right? Okay. Oh, and I want to echo the flat roof thing. Um, <coughs> It doesn't have to be a major pitch, but I know there are some things that can be done, so that doesn't have to be flat. And if I got my way and the building came further forward, then the flat roof would be more visible and more important. So, like I say, it's, it's, I'm sure it's too late to ask, but I think, you're, I think that the building is nice enough that it deserves to come up front and be seen as opposed to look at it, looking at it over a field parking. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, <clears throat> all right, I've got some comments, and I think we'll give you almost a resounding unanimous get rid of the right only out. I um, don't know that anybody's really excited about that, and um, I, I just don't I think it flies in the face of some of the things that we've been trying to do in terms of access and egress on the secondary road. So I would not agree with that either. Um, <coughs> some of the questions that I have is, um, and, I, and I don't know how we necessarily get around it, but I know that we're talking about a variance for uh, the parking field that's dead-ended with greater than 10 spaces. Just want to kind of point that out to the board mm -hmm. uh, that that would be a variance that we would be providing if we uh, went ahead and approved this a at waiver. some point in time. A, a waiver. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I would also like to see the reduced lighting f photometrics at some point. Um, we've already talked about the wetland area impact. Um, one of the questions that I have is on the access road coming in off Lincoln, is I'm assuming that you're going to culvert that, what would be that stream? That's that correct. You, that you're, so I mean any water movement going through there would be going through a, some form of culvert or whatever. That's correct. Okay. Um, that was, I didn't dig into it real deep, but I just wanted to make sure that we were taking care of that. Um, out of curiosity, Spoke a little bit about the transformer. Where are you thinking about putting a dumpster? Uh, the dumpster would be on the left-hand side of the building on the out outermost uh, part. Is it on there? Yes, on the the left. at the top. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that's what that was. My bad. looks like Mickey Mouse. Um, any thought towards snow storage? Um, yes, that's on there too. Um, generally, to the, at the wrong plan. Apparently, uh, to the north I'm and south. To the, to the what? North basically, kind of behind the building on one side. All right, I'm looking at the pretty color drawing. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. My apologies. Just wanted to make sure we address this. It's two, it. one minute. It's two, I know. I three and you're out. <laughs> <laughs> if it's getting late, I can make that happen. <laughs> um, think that is all the notes that I have. Other stuff again is repetitive again, but uh, obviously. Um, if there's anything we can do in terms of the uh, historical significance of the site in some fashion or another, that would be awesome. Um, I would love to see the archery located. I thought that was a great idea in terms of 
having that um, appear at one of the pathways and maybe some kind of a, even a plaque um, memorializing that. I thought that was just a superb idea. So if there's a way to incorporate that, that would be great. And I think that's pretty much what I had. The only, I, I guess my last comment would be um, <clears throat> the, the hospice that's up on Honeywell Hill has come back to us at least once, if not twice, in regards to parking. It's always been an issue kind of moving forward. We've had to deal with it on several occasions. Um, I hope that we get it somewhat close this time. And, and I appreciate that you're going to not build the whole thing out, but you've got it situated. And so if the need arises, we know what's happening because if we have to deal with anything in terms of that, um, uh, it's great to do it up front. So I appreciate those efforts. And I just encourage you to go back and make, even though you're hitting the, the requirement in terms of parking, as far as the codes go, let's make sure we hit the requirement in terms of the needs of the space. So uh, that's just one of those things that's good to get right or as close to right as we can get it the first time. And that's all I have. Any other questions for us? Um, j just real quickly, yeah, we appreciate what you're saying about parking. One thing I think maybe didn't come across real clear about how this facility is used, uh, it's used uh, for bereavement services, it's used for staff that does, you know, management, it's used for education, and so that was one of the reasons, we talked about this a lot last summer, that we want to be set back a, a little bit different setting, and that was a discussion we went into great detail last summer, but in terms of the parking, um, we serve, uh, I think, 130, 40 people per day out in their homes. And the, the caretakers that are out there come in, check in, pick up charts, deal with medical issues, and then they're back out in the field. So our, all of our employees aren't here day by day. Okay. Most of them are out in the field. So I think we have plenty of parking. The concern was if there was future expansion in the site in the future, and that's, that's what Bill was talking about. The other thing is we've had this under contract with Hannaford for a year, and we're up against the gun uh, to close. So it's a big uh, commitment for a nonprofit. We do, after tonight, if we can get uh, the approvals with whatever conditions you have, and we understand the point on the, uh, the right exit that you don't want that. If you remove that and, and uh, got us approved tonight, then we can close, and, and we don't have further time. So we really hope we can get there tonight. And if there's the things that you need us to come back and show you in the future, we certainly can do that. Appreciate that. I guess ultimately, if we do approve tonight, we won't see you again until there's a site plan change. So I have little um, little thoughts in terms of that. I, I, I still think we've got it. I'm not sure that. Well, I know I'm not necessarily <coughs> quite ready to um, to move on this. I, I I think the the issue in terms of um, some of the landscaping issues that I don't think are resolved yet. Um, the right-hand turn is not a big deal um, in terms of you know re removing that. I think that's can be easily done. Um, I don't know where the rest of the board stands here, but a historical question. Yeah, I, I haven't seen any signage, no lighting. I, I would not like to see it held up, though, because of the historical. Uh, well, that would be the only thing. But that may be cost prohibitive for them. And, and uh, that, to me, I mean, if they're willing to do uh, some recognition, fine. But I would not like to see that simply because of the historical. I'd like to my opinion. I'd like to make a comment about that, if I may. I don't think we're holding anything up. We're going on the same routine that we always go through. And if this was something that needed to be decided tonight, I, I kind of would like to have known that before we started. I had no idea that we were looking for an original, were we informed that we wanted a... 
It says in my thing, uh, site plan review. It doesn't say anything about initial approval. Well, I agree with you at that part. Well, I'm totally it's just that I don't think we're holding anything up is what I'm saying. No, I'm saying in the big picture. I agree with you as far as not expecting to make a final approval tonight. Well, I think they're asking for Yeah, I, I just think we can clean some things up and make this all all buttoned up. But to me, I think this collectively goes beyond what we would typically handle through conditions, and I, I think it always puts the puts the board in a tough position position when we're presented with financing deadlines and things like that. Right. Really, don't know ahead of time. Um, so I I would agree with Susan that you know, we're 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 going through our our typical process. This is the first time we've seen this in almost a year, and I think we've made a lot of progress. And I mean, there is the next meeting is July 14th, and staff can certainly between now and then, if given a number of issues that have been figured out tonight, particularly the right turn lane, which is a big open item coming into the meeting, we can put a draft motion together for board consideration. It mm -hmm. seems like you're down to a limited number of decision points. Um, and this could be, I'm sure, Bill, you can turn around an updated plan without the right turn lane and maybe some clarity on a few of those items and <coughs> be in good position for your next meeting. Yeah, I mean, I agree. It's It's highly unusual that we go from master plan to a site plan approval in one meeting. Agreed. Agreed. And I'm not saying that because you haven't done a thorough job. I think you're doing a very thorough job. I just think that um, we need to let all of this stuff sink in before I can just move forward with it personally. Yes. I oh, uh, would like to just comment on a couple of things. First of all, uh, we did submit signage. Uh, signage will, will be very similar to uh, what hospice currently has on Route 1. Right now there's two panels. The top one's hospice. The bottom one is something else. This will be identical except it won't have the bottom panel. Uh, two uh, signs are proposed, one on Lincoln, one on Route 1. Um, the landscaping, um, uh, there's quite a bit of uh, earth berming on Route 1, overstory trees, and then a, a fairly substantial amount of understory uh, plantings um, uh, to really conceal the um, uh, parking. Um, hospice is trying to, um, uh, they'll have a formal lawn around the building. But other than that, um, use a very naturalized, low-maintenance um, landscape approach. Um, in terms of looking out of the building towards Route 1, um, uh, the parking is broken up. It's, it's terraced. So you'll look out, you'll see the driveway. Then you'll actually, see, because of the uh, terracing, you'll see a green band uh, representing uh, stepping up in grade then the first bay of parking, then again a band, and then the um, uh, berming out, outside. So I think in both directions the parking, um, uh, it won't be a sea of parking, but it's, it's pretty well broken up largely because of the, um, the grades that we have on the site. Are we also looking for, excuse me, uh, sanitary district approval that even then They've provided, they've provided capacity to serve letters. We don't always require sanitary district approval before this board's approval. Okay. So they've provided capacity to serve. Okay. They have their DEP and Army Corps yep. permits in hand. So I would think it would be pretty simple to just kind of clean up the rest of it and according to the staff comments and Bring it back. Yep. I don't think there will be a whole lot beyond that. Sue? Okay. 
as I say, I wasn't here for the original thing a year ago. But I think that what it is we're looking at in order to grant an initial approval, I should be able to see it. Do I, are the, um, I can't, what am I trying to say, um, signage in here? Yeah. It is? Yeah, it's a photo of their signage on Route 1. That sounds like they want to replicate the signage existing down on Route 1 at their current headquarters. Where is it? Okay. That is um, is attachment that? L. I'm sorry, I. Attachment I. I, 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 I don't have I. Not get enough package. Well, see, the, the problem is. We didn't get I. I didn't get I. No. So, and, and the lighting isn't in here. Okay. Yeah. Before we spend. Too, but there is. Yeah, it's been supplied, but it's not in this packet. So maybe what needs to happen is that I need to make sure that I sit down and look at the full packet with staff before the next meeting, and that will keep me quiet about those things tonight. And then whether or not we, um, I don't think we ought to wait. For the so I look at my package. I got attachment A, B, E, H, and M. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, so. you know, the thing is that everybody else has seen it. It was a year ago, but I, but it's my problem if I haven't seen it. So I'll go to staff. Yeah, I mean, if we get this cleaned up, we can treat it as a consent item at the next meeting. Right? Yep. I think we're that close, but not quite ready yet. Yeah, for the benefit of the applicants, a consent item doesn't require consultant presence and a presentation. So if staff prepares a draft motion, plus the board has questions, it's not a discussion item, and therefore you don't need to have your... Um, your consulting staff be here for Q and A and presentation. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, given the hour, I'd like to take a short break here and reconvene at 20 out.
this a land reclamation review for a residential subdivision <coughs> off Highland Avenue? Before I ask Mr. Bacon to introduce this, I would like to take a second and um, on behalf of the planning board, recognize the loss of the Rosbera family. We wish them well as they work through all the issues that they're facing. So, uh, having said that, Mr. Bacon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is uh, maybe the closest we could come to in terms of the right process for uh, the request to, to start some work out on this site and add some uh, material that the applicant has available um, before a final subdivision approval. Uh, I think it is a good mechanism to enable some board review and approval of adding some berming material along Howland Avenue. Um, applicants put together a package under the town's land reclamation ordinance, which generally is geared towards gravel pits and reclamation afterwards, but there are some standards that make sense for this application, and uh, the applicant followed uh, that process and has provided a good submission in that regard. Uh, the only comment staff has at this point is uh, Jim Wendell, town engineer, provided uh, three recommendations on the preparation of the plan. I think most importantly, doing some erosion control also along the ditch along Highland Avenue um, so that that stormwater facility is not impacted by uh, the berming. So if, um, if these items are updated and incorporated into the plan, then staff is, has no issues with moving forward with um, this work prior to subdivision approval. Thank you, Dan. <coughs> Good evening. <coughs> Good evening. Thank you, uh, members of the board. Uh, my name is Lee Allen, Northeast Civil Solutions. I'm here tonight with uh, Rocky Risbera from Risbera Brothers Construction. Um, the plan we're presenting in front of you shows the dark green shaded area. It's the ultimately a going to be a landscape berm, a, a feature of the subdivision plan. It will be ultimately planted with trees and shrubs as part of our landscape plan for the subdivision. Um, but the issue before us is that they have a, a great deal of material at the town and country site off the of Foley Farm Road that they would like to move in place um, where they need a bunch of material for the berm. Uh, so quite simply, it's the plan to be approved is construction of a berm, it's about 1,600 cubic yards of material um, with just uh, erosion control notes and it's, it's very simply what you see here. Um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank, thank you, Lee. Okay. I'm all set. I'm fine with it. Okay. Thank you. I'm all set. Same here. Same here. Corey. Ron. Same except uh, as noted by Dan with the ditch along Highland Avenue. Mm -hmm. just want to emphasize that. Okay. Uh, I also am fine with this. I am <coughs> trying to give Dan a little bit of time to write the condition that he wants, so. Left hand is going to take a while. Uh, hey, hey. <laughs> oh wow. God. You were walking today. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> Some things never change. All right. Uh, I'd like to move that we approve the Rigney Farm Subdivision Rosbera Construction Inc. request for land reclamation review at the residential subdivision off Highland Avenue with the condition that the plan be updated to address comments provided in town engineer memo dated 6-17-14. Is there a second? We have a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Yeah, let's show that to be unanimous. Let's move on to item number eight. Rigney Farm Subdivision, Rosbera Brother Construction, Inc. requests a preliminary plan review for a 13-lot residential subdivision off Highland Avenue in the R2 zone. Mr. Bacon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The board seen this um, before at sketch plan review in the last few months. Uh, and since <coughs> that time, uh, both staff and Water and Curran have had a chance to review. Um, we should have a uh, staff review memo uh, dated for this meeting as well as uh, Water and Current Civil Engineering Review Memo 
uh, with a range of stormwater design related comments. Um, in terms of the staff comments, just a few high points at this point. Um, the applicant still needs to, to work through the street naming with um, Marla St. Pierre at uh, the Public Safety Department. And I think that's something that can be accomplished uh, after this meeting. Um, this is kind of a legal technical item, um, but we do need further evidence that the applicant has legal rights to modify the, the access to the Jackson properties. Uh, given the right-of-way configurations being adjusted, we assume that that's, um, you're able to acquire that given they're um, conveying the, the land uh, for the subdivision, but that's a, that's a detail we'd like to see um, clarified for the board and staff. Um, one of the maybe larger items um, that we encourage the board and applicant to think about are, is the, the rain garden designs for the stormwater uh, treatment areas. Uh, we actually support and appreciate this direction the applicant's going because um, it is more of an LID approach to stormwater, which the town has been in general encouraging the last few years. Um, but we're um, concerned about individual property owners knowing the purpose and the, and the need to maintain these rain gardens and, and not alter them in the future. Um, so um, I imagine there's a range of solutions to, to kind of prevent alterations to these areas and what may look like um, backyards. Uh, one idea would be to think about actually making them part of the open space for the subdivision that would take it out of the, um, their property ownership um, if that's not the ideal approach for the applicant or the board, uh, maybe some other ways to, to kind of isolate or um, demarcate that portion of the private property from the rest of someone's yard so that they know that um, that can't be leveled off um, even with the rest of their backyard or um, altered in any way. So that's something to, to talk through with the applicant and figure out the best way to make sure that those are viable stormwater facilities for years to come. Um, I think beyond that, um, my only other staff comment I think maybe has been addressed today is capacity to serve um, confirmation from both the Senator District and Portland Water District, and I, I think Lee um, has been able to secure those in the last few days, um, but that was also in the staff comments to be reviewed by the board. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's the comments I have at this point. Thanks, Dale. Great. Welcome back. Welcome. I'm back. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Wanted to um, appreciate the board uh, going through this and wanted to let you know that we did receive um, ability to serve letter from the Portland Water District very late this afternoon. Um, forwarded it to Jay's email. I don't believe since Jay is off in, I think Dan said he was in Vegas, I, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> Today? Um, he didn't have a chance to forward that on. He did get my earlier emails and forward them on to Dan. Um, but I have hard copies if you'd like to see them from both the uh, sanitary district and the water district um, showing that there is ability to serve for both water and sewer. Um, this project, as you recall, is to construct about 1,200 feet of road. Um, it's going to be a public, hopefully be a public road when um, we're done with it. Um, it's going to have municipal water from the water district, obviously, a low pressure sewer that will run along that municipal way out to Highland Ave and then up to Pleasant Hill Ave. There's a manhole at the intersection where the low pressure sewer will pump to. Um, it's also going to be served by underground electric. Um, that conduit is run alongside the road, and, and that's also throughout the 1,200 feet. Uh, some of the questions that Dan brought up had to do with the private way. The private way is actually owned all right now by the Stephen Rigney family. That is part of the property that the Risberas have under contract. So they will own the, the entire entity. When they re-subdivide the land, the intent is to create that public right-of-way for the proposed road. With You'll see a sliver of land to create what will now be called Banneger Way. That Banneger Way will provide the frontage for that Jackson lot that's located um, just to the south of this property. So we believe, to make it clear and, and simple legally, they own everything.
everything, Riz Bears own everything right now, they're going to deed that strip of land to Jackson, which will become the Banneger Way private way. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward. If there's any questions, be happy to go through that. Um, rain garden issue, um, the reason we went in that direction was we wanted to follow the town's instructions for the low impact development stormwater. Um, better to treat, the intent is to, with low impact development is to treat several small areas instead of combine in one and, and treat globally in one area. That's why we looked at that. So we have a combination of rain gardens and roof edge drip filters that we're getting treatment from each of the lots. And really the under drain filter that's to the northern eastern side of the lot is to really to treat most of the runoff from the road. So we're trying to deal with each of the lots on the lot, the road in that one specific spot. And I believe we can come up with easements or, or some way to demarcate those areas. Um, as you're probably aware, this project requires a DEP permit. That DEP permit has maintenance procedures that go with each of the stormwater facilities that we have, including the rain gardens, the drip edge filters, and the under drain filter that um, treats the road runoff. That maintenance has to be done, records have to be kept, um, and that's all part of the DEP permitting process. I think with that, I, I think I've, I've covered the, the main things and be happy to answer any other questions you might have. All right. <coughs> Thanks, Lee. Mr. Mazur. Uh, I'm going to pass for the moment. John? I really got very few comments. There's one in there requesting a sidewalk waiver, and I have no problem with that, considering the size of that neighborhood. on the preliminary approval, are we? Preliminary approval. Tonight it's is preliminary <coughs> approval. I may never get back into the swing of things again. Okay. Um, rain gardens. I don't know an awful lot about how they function, but I have an attitude towards anything that has to do with folks not uh, changing. 
anything on their lot that isn't really theirs to change. And in this case, it would be the rain gardens. So I think that when we say we're going to work with the applicant, if we're looking for preliminary, one of the things that would have to be done before final would be to figure out how we're going to do that. <coughs> if we're going to stay with the, with the rain gardens, how are we going to label them and et cetera, because people pay no attention to them. I mean, to, to the fact that that's there, or we can deal with it. Okay, I'm looking at lot five. So the, uh, actually, it's on lot six. Drainage and maintenance easement to benefit the homeowners association. It's just that that particular, is this because it's going into the wet pond? Right, that's a um, it's either culvert or swale to get into the wet pond or the under drain filter. Okay. I just turned it three pages and there it was. Because wet uh, rain gardens are a new concept to me, when somebody buys a lot, are they going to be buying the lot or are they going to be buying the house built on the lot? Is this going to be a build? I'm going to walk it. I'm going to, yeah. You know what I'm trying to say? Good evening. Hi. Bucky Risbera. I'll try to address that. It is our intention to build all of these houses ourselves. And then sell it as a complete package. We sell it as a complete package. I won't tell you that I won't sell a lot to somebody. Right. But I will tell you if I do sell a lot to somebody, I'm going to do the site work on it. Okay. So the rain gardens will be built as part of the package. Okay. That's, um, thank you. My thought is that if we could put a note on the plan, when I sell a lot, I sell... I sell a package, and I make sure every one of my customers gets a copy of the signed subdivision plan. And, and they point it out to them that ago, that's there. And, that and it, it'll be on the plan. Now, what somebody does with that, I don't know. But I don't know what else we can do other than to make it crystal clear to that first home buyer that this is what they're buying. Perhaps even a, a note in the deed or a restriction in the deed would need to be done so that it does pass on. I like that. It, would, it probably falls you know, to code enforcement, I guess, to ultimately... To, to be the policeman on it, but I think well, it's a lot easier to police done. it if it's on the deed. And on I really the plan and, and, and in the deed, I have think we done the, any of yeah. these on yeah. residential before? We've had certainly have had a good number of stormwater buffers that are similarly similar. not supposed to be altered. Okay. Um, where they're, the grading is designed to be that buffer, right. or there's a different treatment of the lot. This is a bit different because there's a bit more stormwater installation with it, um, but it's not unlike stormwater buffers. It's just right. more. That's one of the things that's always concerned me is when we not. I mean, I didn't have a name like this before, but the concept that these buffers are there, and once the owner moves in, we lose all control. But it would be nice if we turn it over to code enforcement for them to know it's going to be in the deed. I like that a lot. Okay, that takes care of that question. Thank you. Um, that may be the extent of my questions. Um, uh, sidewalks. I'm going to, uh, in this particular situation, I don't seem to have much of a um, mental health issue around <laughs> not having them in this, in this um, development. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Didn't you hear earlier that part of the stormwater management is these are these rain gardens? Yes, yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. So that's obviously it's going to be in the covenant. It's part, it's part of the maintenance, so that's right. going to be part of the deep covenants and deep restrictions to begin with. Correct. Great okay. point. That clears that up. If you try to put a, you know, make it a little more clear on the plan that, right. that yep. it's not to be altered, and I don't know what else we can do to. Make sure they're not. We can only hope for the next 50 years, 200 from now, who knows? Go ahead. I'm just listening. I'm taking it in. Um, yeah, I, I, I obviously, the deed restrictions I think is a great idea. We know that there's going to be some kind of a maintenance plan and that's going to be there. I think part of the uncomfortableness with the item is that we just haven't seen a lot of it. So it's relatively new, right? It's a new style. It's a new way of doing things. Like everything else, change is always comes with a little bit of uncomfort or discomfort, I should say. Um, is that number three? <laughs> just, just one. I, I didn't hear that. All right. Um, the um, so I, I really think that that 
kind of is part of what we need to do, and I think almost as a town we need to figure out how we want to address it in general uh, in terms of how do we handle this so that we're doing it the same, you know, each time something like this comes in front of us. So, like I said, it is kind of unique. You know, I just know that, right, as a parent, you got little kids, you want to put up the badminton net, you want to play a little croquet, whatever it is out in the backyard, right, and you get this swale all of a sudden, and, you know, naturally people are going to want to go, well, you know, they want a nice level lawn or, you know, somewhat flat lawn or... Um, so there's gonna it, it's going to be a challenge, I think, um, but certainly what you're recommending doing uh, and how you want to handle the situation with notations and restrictions and all of those other things, I think that's as much as we can ask. Um, and I think you know again, it's it's a great approach, right? Because I think at least you're going to have something that's probably a little bit more maintained on a regular basis than some retention pond somewhere that, you know, all of a sudden becomes an issue over time because nobody's doing anything with it year after year after year. So um, I think it's kind of a cool, neat approach on what we can do. Um, in terms of the sidewalks, again, to me, this is one of the things that we're trying to get into all of our, all of our developments and appreciate the different opinions of the board. I'm going to weigh in with Corey on this one. I also think that it should be there. Um, and again, it's it's a consistency standpoint from what we're trying to accomplish around town as we build developments is putting putting the sidewalks in. It's a lot easier. It's a lot less expensive to do it at the time that all of the other construction is going on in terms of uh, the road work and everything else. It's a much better time to try to do it now than it is to try to get at it later. So um, that that would be my personal feeling. Um, just as a as a different item, I do appreciate you hearing our request in terms of the access way to <coughs> the open space and the change that you made in terms of. Um, the easement to get to it. I appreciate that you did that. Um, I think it works out. Um, you know, the other thing, and you know, I'm going to hit the sidewalk thing again, but we have an interesting situation in this particular development only because lot sizes are actually allowed to be, uh, they're, they're larger than a lot of new subdevelopments that we see going in. So I think, you know, that little strip of land that we're talking about to slide in the sub, uh, sidewalk would be a lot less noticeable on somebody's front lawn. Um, so I just think that we have the opportunity and should go after it. Um, outside of that, I think right, we're waiting for the DEP permit, so we're getting, we're getting very, very close here. So I don't know if you need... Oh, we're going to... We have so a they're looking for preliminary for a preliminary approval. approval. Right. So that has to come back to the board for final approval, which right. you would customarily wait yep. for state permitting right. for issuing. Yep. Um, so I think we need to get this sidewalk situation. Yeah, Mr. Tonight, Chairman, don't we? if I could, I believe that when they first proposed to us, they asked us for recommendations regarding one, the street not having a hammerhead, and the second thing was the sidewalks. And I'm pretty sure we told the applicant that we would be okay with a narrower roadway and with a uh, without, without the sidewalks at that time. This is three months ago? I think you did. Yeah, I'm pretty sure of it, actually. Um, that yeah, and I mean, uh, our feeling at the time was that it was a short street. It didn't, it didn't go to anything. It was never going to connect to industrial <coughs> land that's beyond us, and that we didn't feel like it was it was necessary to have, and I thought I had buy-in. If, if, if I can repeat something I heard at the last meeting, it doesn't hurt to ask. You got it. <laughs> it doesn't hurt to ask. I would prefer not to do the sidewalks. And, uh, I don't know how the board wants to handle that. I don't want it to <coughs> hold up our approval. Uh, if, if, if the majority of the board feels like it's something that has to happen, then, then of course we would, would make it happen. But I, I truly don't feel it's necessary. Um, and I guess I would ask you to make a decision amongst yourselves how, how you feel. But I, I do feel like we did 
talked about this at one time and thought we were going down the road. Uh, it, and, and I believe we did, and I think even at that time, I don't know that everybody was on the same page. Um, but you know, straw poll, <coughs> sidewalks, no. This is what I was listening to. No. I don't know. I really don't. I got because because I agree with you from the standpoint that we've been trying to get sidewalks in and all new projects. That's part of me. The other part of me is the. the that area and the uh, size of this project. So I'm, I'm, I'm really wishy-washy, to be honest with you. <laughs> so that's a one and a half, four and one and a half. Yeah. That's, yeah, so we got, all right, so we got an abstain. I, I just wanted <laughs> just to add as a comment that um, there, there was some preliminary discussion last time, but, I, you know, the, the board has the ability and the discretion to have its feelings evolve. Or, and particularly when we come back and we're considering an approval and we're presented with a, a waiver request. And it is a waiver request, and I, I think we need to make that clear. It's not some new uh, requirement that some of us are looking to impose. Um, again, I do understand it's a small neighborhood, um, and I'm not necessarily concerned about whether it connects to anything else. Um, to me, it's just sort of a kind of a baseline uh, quality of life item, safety item. And I, I personally I personally have a hard time understanding why someone would not want sidewalks in a, in a neighborhood, but that's my own personal opinion, uh, including homeowners in the neighborhood. But, um, that's, that's my piece, and I'm just one vote. Yep. Thanks. I heard a no-no from Dave and Nick, <coughs> Susan. <coughs> Although you get a chance to reconsider if you want, but I don't get a vote. You can get a you can weigh in on the straw poll. No. No. Okay. So if I look at it that way, I got two abstentions, two against, and three for. So there you go. Takes care of the numbers. Okay. Um, I don't think you need any conditions on preliminary. Yep. There's yep. a few yep. items conditions. that are yep. the applicants aware of. So. Right. So any other comments? Our final yeah. approval would be back. <coughs> any other comments from the board? No. All right, so at this Excuse point. Me, Chairman? Yes. Uh, what was the straw poll result? Uh, no sidewalks. Okay. Three to two to two, if you will. Okay. I'd like to um, make a motion that we grant preliminary subdivision approval to Rigney Farm Subdivision, Rosberra's Brother Construction, Inc., for a review or, or for a site of 13 lot residential subdivision off Highland Avenue in the R2 zone. Second. We have a second. And that was John. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor. And I show that to be unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item this evening is Leighton Farm Subdivision. Leighton Farm LLC request a subdivision review for 99 single family lots off Elmwood Ave in the R2 zone. Mr. Bacon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The board's uh, seen this project a few times now through the sketch plan review process, and they're now before you for their initial preliminary subdivision review. They've also been through the peer, re peer review process, both on <coughs> civil engineering and traffic review. Um, in addition to that, the Conservation Commission has reviewed the project and has provided some comments that are attached to the staff uh, review memo. And um, this is also the first project uh, the Planning Board seen that would have been uh, required to go through DEP site law review for larger subdivisions, larger commercial projects. Um, but given the updates of the zoning ordinance, subdivision ordinance, and the like in the past uh, three or four months, this project does not need to go through that process. Um, but there has been some review done by the state agencies um, <coughs> in, 
inland fish and wildlife and historic preservation uh, that usually is uh, wrapped up in the site law review process. So uh, the applicants provided those memos from the state. Um, a change or uh, new information since sketch plan review that's affecting the project um, and actually coincides with your public hearing yeah. is uh, the transmission tower that's on site. Um, it's an FAA tower. Uh, it, it does qualify as a transmission tower and meets that definition. And given the, the current requirements for that, there's a requirement that 100% of the height of the tower needs to be on a on the parcel for the tower, um, and that affects um, a big component of the subdivision design, the, the roadway coming, uh, I guess, what is it, Sean, the more southerly roadway, the roadway proposed closer to the connector out of the two entrance roads. Um, it affects that road location and also the lots that were proposed next to the tower. Um, there can be uh, some relief from the current standards, depending on the outcome of the transmission tower amendments, but that still needs to go through um, additional council consideration. So um, that is something that's affecting the design of an aspect of the project. I'm sure the applicant will talk more about that. Um, in addition to that, in the staff comments um, before and, and with the current round of comments, there's been some suggestion that consideration be given to making some pedestrian improvements that could help serve the project and um, serve the greater neighborhood um, out between Green Acres Lane and Route 1. Um, there's in the pedest Elk Hill pedestrian plan there's a recommendation for a sidewalk connection um, from where a recent sidewalk went in along Green Acres uh, uh, Lane out to Route 1. Um, given the full uh, potential of this project. Uh, there could be some some need for um, pedestrian safety out there and accommodations given the amount of traffic coming in and out of the project at, at build out and hopefully the amount of pedestrians that might want to come for the project and, and link in to all the sidewalks and activity along Route 1. So that's something to, to talk about. Um, also, with this project, there are some stormwater facilities on individual sites. You just talked about that with the last project, and um, just making sure that, to the best of the town, the applicant's ability, that <coughs> new homeowners are aware of those facilities, that um, they be clearly denoted, and um, do what we can to prevent future kind of alterations to those so that they continue to operate the way they're designed and the way they're installed. So, I encourage. Um, more thought on that as we talk about this project. Um, I think since the last time you saw that, this the applicants added some additional access points to the open space, which has been uh, a goal of the town, given the significant amount of conservation land that with this open space and then the town land uh, really adds up to uh, a nice uh, natural resource along the Nonsuch River. So access to that open space for folks outside the neighborhood would be definitely a, a benefit to the town. Um, and I think those are the, the higher points. As I mentioned, the Conservation Commission had a, um, a cluster of comments uh, that are in the staff comments. Maybe the most notable is um, giving thought to uh, the stream crossing design. Um, that's something they brought up. There's a location where there's uh, a stream on the site that the roadway crosses and, and thinking about uh, the, the least impactful way of designing a crossing there was, uh, was on uh, was a recommendation of the commission. Um, so with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Dan. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Members of the board, my name is Sean Frank. I'm a civil engineer with Sebago Technics. Uh, with me tonight is uh, Vincent Maeda, uh, principal of uh, Leighton Farm LLC. As, uh, as Dan stated, we were here at the end of last year, the beginning of this year, uh, working uh, with this group uh, through the sketch plan process and specifically the number of lots and the general layout associated with that. I think you'll see that the plan we're presenting tonight for preliminary 
uh, is very close in keeping with uh, those conversations that we had with the board at that time. Uh, obviously, since January, we've spent a lot of time in terms of getting into the detailed design and coordinating uh, the utilities and those types of things. Uh, I met with the fire department, Portland Water District, the, the sanitary uh, district, uh, the main department of environmental protection, and uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, as well as obviously uh, numerous meetings with uh, with uh, town staff. Uh, and we've proceeded along uh, with the overall project design uh, as you see before you. Uh, our intent, obviously, at that point in time, was to come forward with 99 lot subdivision on those of on approximately 80 acres of property. Of that 80 acres, approximately 46 acres uh, would be retained as open space, and 34 acres would be part of the development. So. Uh, a great deal, more than half of the land would actually be uh, conserved uh, as currently outlined. Um, we would have municipal water and sewer service throughout. Uh, sewer service down to a certain point on both of the roads going back uh, to Elmwood. Uh, and then a low pressure sewer system again in coordination with the, uh, the Scarborough Sanitary District to service the rest of it. Uh, we would have uh, sidewalks on one side of the roadway throughout the project. As Dan discussed, uh, we had proposed extending the trails to make sure they connected to the sidewalks. Uh, we had one parking spot uh, originally proposed uh, down in this area uh, to provide some off-street parking. Uh, we did discuss with staff and now proposing now we will have a temporary turnaround associated with uh, the phase one construction uh, to reconfigure that after phase one, ex after we extend into phase two uh, to provide some additional off-site parking, uh, again, to access the trails in that location. Uh, in terms of the sidewalk uh, off from First Street, of course, you know, uh, from a development standpoint, we just keep adding up. Uh, you know, we had a lot of traffic impacts. We have a lot of sewer impacts. Uh, recreational impacts, and it was just seemed to be one more thing. So we would like consideration at some point. Again, we certainly don't. I don't think need a final answer from you tonight. Um, obviously, the whole tower issue, which is Jay is referenced as a threshold issue, is certainly a threshold issue for us as well. Uh, so we understood that that was now some limitations associated with a couple of the lots within that general area in terms of when those could be offered for sale. Uh, certainly, we're not of the understanding at that point in time that a right of way line uh, for a proposed roadway was going to be considered a lot line and therefore uh, a part of that consideration as well. Uh, so again, our intent all along had been to basically get a, a 99 lot subdivision approved by you folks that would be constructed in maybe four or five phases. Uh, along those lines, uh, we've submitted a complete stormwater permit application to the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, we're very close to uh, receiving their approval. I would anticipate that within the next three weeks or so. So what our proposal now at this time is to basically go through that whole process, have the overall stormwater, uh, have a project that you folks see is, uh, is pretty clear here now, at least in terms of what the overall layout of that is supposed to be. Uh, but what we'd like to come back into now relatively quickly, if you will, is a subdivision proposal for phase one. Uh, phase one doesn't include anything associated with the tower. Uh, it would basically be those first 23 lots uh, accessed by uh, Owen Way off from Elmwood. Uh, it seems to be the, the relatively most straightforward thing. Uh, we have no idea, obviously, based upon the uh, discussion that went on tonight regarding the tower ordinance and, in fact, when that may be finalized through the process. Obviously, the developer would love to get started on some construction out here this year. Um, you know, we certainly see phase one as, as probably a two-year process. We were always looking at this as probably a 10-year development process with the overall project. Um, and obviously we'd like to get started. Uh, so again, our intent had been was to get the whole thing approved by this board with four or five phases. Um, that is still our intent once we're allowed to proceed, if you will, that we know which direction we can go in based upon what happens with that tower ordinance. Uh, we will uh, resubmit to the board uh, for the, the approval, if you will, of the overall development. Um, we will have the stormwater permit already in hand from the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. We'll certainly have a good handle on uh, traffic. Actually, we've had an initial traffic study that's gone out and been reviewed by the town's review engineer. Uh, and we have actually have a response associated with that, but I didn't know exactly what to do with it, to be honest with you. It seems now that we're down to talking, maybe just coming back forward with phase one. Um, going through some of Jay's comments associated with that. Stormwater, I know, is something you just talked about on the last subdivision. I guess I'd like to just explain that for a few minutes real quickly. Um, 
what it really comes down is the DEP's regulations, which are really the town regulations now for stormwater, is you have to treat stormwater runoff from 95% of the impervious areas. And those impervious areas include the lots. And the lots, I'm saying, for the driveways and the roofs. So if you have a roof that's pitched to the back of the house, you have to pick up the majority of the runoff from those homes. And that's why I think you would lead to these rain gardens, if you will, um, uh, the treatment uh, strips along the uh, foundations. Our experience has just been as if, if you can do it with buffers, stormwater buffers, those are low maintenance. Basically, the idea is you leave them alone. Uh, of course, you have to have the room to do that. And we do have the room uh, between us and the wetlands and including some of the wetlands, but part of that's going to intrude on the lot itself. So we will have to have easements associated with that. Uh, we've had discussion with this, there's a little split rail fence. We always put posts in, you know, marked them, demarcated them as buffers that cannot be disturbed. So they will be part of the overall covenants associated with the, uh, uh, with the project as part of the DEP permit associated with the permit. But I mean, again, rather than physically, and rain gardens are a wonderful thing, but certainly there's a maintenance associated with those. Um, we have the room here for the buffers, but those are the majority of the things that Jim had been talking about or the, uh, the peer review engineer had been talking about was that we were collecting the runoff from the back of these lots and directing it through buffers in accordance with DEP specifications. And again, we can get a little bit more uh, detailed associated with that. I know some of the abutters are here. Uh, from a drainage standpoint, the runoff is coming off the site. Uh, the intent is obviously to maintain that runoff coming off the site. Uh, basically, we will, you know, build up the lots a little bit for the homes themselves and any off-site runoff. Again, I don't want to go cut every tree along that back property line and put some solid swale in that's going to carry the water all down. I'd much rather have it come off generally as it is now, just build up a bit for the lots and let that runoff kind of work its way down the property lines, if you will, get into the road system and then into the road system and get treated into the pond. Um, there would be underground electric and power associated with this, extended from Elmwood. Uh, we do have a stormwater, the purpose of this phase one is that we have a stormwater management pond associated with this. Uh, the overall project actually had uh, two wet ponds and a dry pond associated with the treatment associated with it. As we discussed, we will uh, extend the trails up uh, to the proposed parking areas. I think one of the Conservation Commission's discussions had been adding kiosks and waste receptacles. Uh, you know, what we'd like to do obviously is to provide the parking, provide the trailhead, Provide the open space, and then you know, then it's a town. How, whatever the town wants to do with it at that point, I, you know, uh, uh, I think we'd much rather leave it up in your hands in terms of uh, any additional things that are associated with that. Uh, in terms of the crossing for the stream crossing, we've worked closely with the Army Corps of Engineers as well as the Maine Department of Environmental Protection associated with that stream crossing. And again, it is a small finger of the stream going down, but it, obviously it, it, it does go down uh, to the Nonsuch. Uh, uh, but again, it's quite a distance, if you will, from here down to the river itself. There's a great deal of open space associated with it, and obviously all the stormwater runoff is being uh, treated to current Chapter 500 standards, so uh, uh, we think we're doing a, a fine job from that. So uh, just in a quick recap, we've pretty well worked our way through traffic. I will actually have a traffic movement permit from the state, I believe, in a couple of weeks. We've worked our way through stormwater for the overall project. I will have a stormwater permit from the Maine Department of Environmental Protection in a few weeks. Um, so we will have that in hand, but what I will be resubmitting to you folks is probably a, a preliminary submission that I would like to get at hopefully at the next meeting or very close to a preliminary at that time for phase one, if you will, the 23 lots associated with it. Uh, obviously all the engineering is designed, everything's pretty well done. Um, so that hopefully within the next two meetings or three at the most, we could have phase one approved with the condition that as soon as we're allowed, we come back in and get the remainder of this approved for you, but again, at least allowing the applicant to get started on that phase one out there. So I know I've been a little lengthy here on my conversation, but uh, with that, I'd conclude my uh, conversation and uh, uh, certainly be happy to answer any questions the board has. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, at this point, we do have an opportunity for public comment. If there's anybody here who would like to make comment on this uh, application this evening, please step forward, state your name and address for the record, please. Hi, um, my name is Matt Durgan. I live at uh, 9 Sequoia Lane. Um, I'm a direct abutter to lots 11 and 12. Um, so uh, right now there's a, uh, there's a beautiful tree line. It's probably 50 to 60 feet of trees between my lot and um, it kind of runs all the way down um, between the Denise's property, my property, and the property next to me. Um, so uh, my ask is that we conserve uh, that tree line um, as much as is possible. Uh, it's a 
a lot of beautiful old trees there. Um, it's a kind of natural existing landscape buffer. Um, so uh, that's that's my only ask is that 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 tree line be preserved if possible. I guess I'd also make a comment that uh, you know uh, 99 houses is a fairly substantial subdivision, um, and I, you know it's o Oak Hills or that Honeywell Hill area is a, it's a very old neighborhood. Streets are very narrow. I don't know what the traffic um, assessment has been, but I would be concerned about the that number of houses and the, and the traffic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, not seeing anyone. And if I can, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, the gentleman was very good about uh, uh, grabbing us uh, at, at the break, and uh, the applicant has agreed that you know we'll meet on site with him and, and discuss specifically the trees and where we think the limits associated with that. Again, we have no problem. Only <laughs> the whole idea was obviously only to cut what we have to cut out there. And again, that's why, from a drainage standpoint, the general drainage now is coming. Obviously, that wetland being the, the low spot, the general is at the water is coming to the east and that's like I said that's why I don't want to be cutting this swale if you will that comes all the way along that back property line to direct it to the pond because the only way to construct that swale is basically to cut every tree we have out there so instead uh, uh, and we'll actually again build up for the lots a little bit uh, you know you take the material out to build the cellar uh, leave the building up a little bit grade around that and then obviously in between that grading whatever is sheeting off from the back property will just work its way down between between the buildings yeah. themselves uh, those lots are higher than the road, uh, so then it'll get into the road system and then get treated and detained that way. Again, on the lower lots, that's where we have the buffer areas, if you will, uh, because again, obviously, these lots aren't going to drain back into the roadway, and I still have to pick up the runoff from at least the back of those lots. And so that's where it's into the buffers, if you will, uh, in terms of maintaining those buffers and to assure that those don't di disturb some point in the future. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yes. My my one question it just struck me as odd, and it's probably not very major. You have a little sliver um, in phase two that says phase three. It's just a tiny sliver at the back of a couple of properties. What is that all about? Because when I say I don't do any swales, so that's that's to include a swale on that back. Because I, again, I have to pick up the back of these lots. And that was the only way I could do was by a small swale. So I have a small swale that's going to pick up the back of these lots and get it into the pond. This is the pond it has to go in. So I just included this part of that phase. So we'll, we'll build the pond. We'll build that part of the phase at the same time. So what would happen to those lots if you built them in phase two without that swale there? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm excuse me. It gets down to this pond. So again, the whole point of this swale is to get it down to that pond. That infrastructure won't be in until phase three. I apologize. So what's the impact on the phase two properties while that phase three hasn't begun? You've got that what we would have is that the back of those two lots, mm -hmm. all right, wouldn't be treated until phase three gets constructed. All right. All right, so the back of those two lots. So, I mean, again, I'm allowed 5%, so it's one of those moving targets. Yeah, where's the water running at, in that area? It's actually coming down now uh, to this wetland that's down in through here. Again, what we're going to be doing is, so again, it will naturally work its way down into it the way it always will. And of course, this will also be undeveloped at this time. We've been up here, this is uh, the field area, if you will, where those towers are. Then it goes into the woods. So again, these back, will, again, this won't be developed, so this will be working its way through the woods, down to the wetlands, and then off from the site. Um, so again, those two lots, if I have those developed, okay, if those are actually built before I get into phase three, um, then I would have those two lots draining off into the woods, if you will, until I get that swale in place. Uh, but again, there's no real point putting that in there until I have some place for it to go. All right. Um, I, and just just a general thought. You, we, you mentioned the trail connection and <coughs> trash cans and a kiosk and all that. And I, I, I kind of on the fence on this. I, I think you're right. I think at some point the town takes responsibility for making it a focal point in the future. Um, but at some point as well, with a project of this size, I think it's probably one of those items where that would build up a, a good amount of goodwill in the neighborhood, but also just to clearly delineate, you know, this is a space that we want people in the neighborhood to use. So I'm on the fence about how that all pans out, but at the same time, 
you know, what are these kiosks going to say? Is that going to be me and Vinny decide what the kiosks are going to say? And are you comfortable with that? I mean, and who's going to pick up the trash? And uh, you know, again, it just unfortunately it just leads to. And again, they're probably not big issues, but it's just it just seems it's going to be town-owned property with town trails and. They want get, what are the kiosks going to say? I mean, and whatever again, you want to say, I, I think appreciate. encouraging the use of that space is also is, is important to this project. I mean, I think I think you need. I mean, you're developing an enormous amount of land here. So, what you know, uh, what I'm trying to say is, it's. I don't uh, know. I don't. I'm still lost. I don't know exactly what you're looking for. On this. I mean, I, I don't know how much major improvements I want to see through there. Whether you're just gonna you know just gonna mow it and say this is your entrance. I you know I'm not quite clear on. No, we're actually gonna have a little parking area there. All right. Okay, with a connection to the trail, and the trail will look, you know, a trail coming off from the parking area. I'm sorry. But we weren't proposing any signage I might whatsoever. Have missed it. You, how many parking spaces were? Well, I hadn't designed this one. This one I have about, I think, five or six proposed down here. And this one, again, right now, this will be a temporary turnaround. Mm -hmm. So what do we do with that? I, you know, I think Jay and I were thinking to probably provide four parking spaces. Okay. All right. And that, that detail, obviously. Yes, long, again, I had it for the other one. It's yeah. kind of, you know, again, okay. working with staff and, you know, what is that going to look like? But, uh, no, we, we weren't proposing any signage. Uh, I'll be the first to admit that. I mean, again, I don't know exactly what the signage would say. Um, I don't think the intent is to, uh, now, again, the trails are there, and it's to the benefit of everybody. And that's what I mean. I, you know, I don't think the intent was, you know, to let's drag everyone in from West Scarborough or something to come on down and visit the spot. Traffic either, but... Um, all right. I just wanted to be wanted to be clear about how that was going to be handled. I think it's probably what's no. I appreciate it. Our, our 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 proposal is is to again obviously we'll be cutting off some of the trails that are up here is to make sure that you know people have access to all the trails within the open space that they have access from what will be in this case a parking area at the end of in the start phase two and a parking area within phase three. I think that's what I've got for right now, but I think something's going to hit me as you guys start talking, so okay. I'll, I'll pass the baton to Dave. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I guess I have to bring it up again. Um, in your letter, you, item number seven, you, you talked about the exterior or off-site sidewalk, uh, and you just talked about it again. Um, no. I, I agree with you. This project is going to create a tremendous amount of impact fees to the town. And it, the way I feel, if the town wants an off-site sidewalk there, then the town should build it. Well, we certainly appreciate it. Again, it's just... Uh, and the last thing we want to see is that we're not good neighbors and that, you know, we're not trying to work with everybody because we certainly are. And uh, we've, we've, we've tried to do our certain best. And, again, certainly, you know, we'll have the cross-hack. There is an existing uh, sidewalk on the opposite side of Elmwood, uh, you know, crosswalks connecting at least, you know, our sidewalks to them. Yeah. They're right. You're, you know, it's uh, a quarter mile away, and I, I, I don't know what's involved in building the sidewalk up to no, there. No, I, I sympathize with you. And, uh, you know, I, again, I think, uh, I think it's the – Responsibility of the town to uh, to build sidewalks. That's the only item I have. Thank you, Corey. <coughs> Thanks. Um, I apologize if I if I missed it, but there had been a comment uh, in the staff memo about the fact that the uh, intersect that that Green Acres and Layton Farms seem to be slightly offset. And that's absolutely true. It. And remember, with the sketch plan, we said we'd go talk to the neighbors, and we did have a comment. And they're very nice, very, very cordial people. Um, but what we did come back is it, it seemed like that wasn't going to work. So we, uh, I met with uh, the town engineer and the public works director. Uh, we still maintain the exact 50-foot right-of-way, but rather than you know, we're actually bringing in, so it's at 90 degrees. That gets us, I think it's about a five-foot offset from the center line. Of, uh, of Green Acres Avenue. I mean, obviously, we'd love it to have it, but again, if it's if it's real close anyway, then you know, it's it still works pretty much like a four-way stop. Uh, so we bring this in just a little bit. What that does is kind of skew the road within the right of way, if you will. So the road is all within the right of way, the sidewalk, the road, everything else. But it'll actually come and have a very slight curve, and then by the time we're about to this curve, everything's recentered again. But again, Public Works and, and the city engineer were comfortable with that. Uh, also in association with uh, the discussion with the traffic engineer. 
engineer, um, once this road is in, they would something like that to be a full four-way stop, stop signs on all four roads uh, that are coming there, and, and we're comfortable with that as well. Appreciate that explanation. Uh, in terms of the uh, stormwater treatment on the private lots and the so-called rain gardens, we discussed that pretty extensively yes. tonight, and I certainly, again... Well, rather than rain gardens, we'll, we're proposing buffers. Right. And, and again, the nice part is we just have the room for it. Um, it right. does include someone on the lots, but at least a maintenance of a buffer is basically uh, leave it alone. Right, right. No, and I realize and I appreciate that distinction. Um, on the, uh, the the question about uh, signage or whatever else for the trailhead, I wonder, and this kind of thinking out loud, I don't know whether staff can answer this or maybe it's something to look, to look into just as a general topic whether there is some sort of a protocol at the town level for sort of accepting these types of things, sort of public access to trails and things like that, and or whether there's a role, if there isn't already, for Conservation Commission to play um, in, that, in that process so that there is, I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that one of the things the Conservation Commission supports is at least in addition to making sure that there's some access to some of these lands that people are generally aware of it, and I understand what you're saying about not necessarily wanting to make it a tourist draw, but at least make the town, people in the town aware that it's available. So I, I guess that's just a general comment that maybe that's something worth clarifying or, no, it's or discussing going forward. Now, it's something we, we tend to look for, for it, particularly in projects of this scale, and I agree with Nick that it's important to make sure that the applicant's willing to, to provide something like that, that we make sure that it doesn't get, the ball doesn't get kind of dropped at that point. So. Yeah, there are, um, actually there's a template for sort of trailhead parking that a few other subdivision projects have used. Um, the one that comes to mind is the Southgate Church project off of Gorham Road. They have a two, a three parking space trailhead. It's a pretty simple sign, and we can, uh, well, figure that out working with the Conservation Commission. And, and again, a simple talk. sign. I have no problem with a simple sign. I mean, I, I was thinking kiosk. I mean, somehow I'm seeing, you know, glass enclosures with, the, you know, the history of, uh, in, uh, I, I don't know. I guess. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, <laughs> and as you gaze off to the left over to, uh, but I, oh, yeah, obviously a, a simple sign that says tra trailhead parking or something, I mean, I, I certainly don't think we have an issue with that. Yeah, we'll no. figure that out with okay. Sean and the Conservation Commission. Thank you. And then on the... <laughs> To go back to the sidewalk uh, sidewalk topic, um, in this case, I, I I think there's a real distinction in that we're talking about something off-site as opposed to what we were talking about with the last proposal. Um, and I do I, I'm a little more ambivalent when it comes to the off-site improvements, particularly when their impact fees are already being generated. Um, you know, I guess maybe I feel a little bit different philosophically than Mr. Buffard about whose role that should be in certain cases. I mean, I, we have a hard time in this town paying for basic things. Um, so I think we kind of try to be opportunistic when we know that there's already infrastructure being put in place. As our chairman noted before, um, uh, you know, there, there's some advantages to doing it when overall project's being done. So that's more of a general comment. But in this case, just kind of circle back. I'm, I, I don't think it's... Uh, necessary to require the, the off-site development of the sidewalks. Oh, yeah. Great, thank you. John? I've got very little. Uh, guys done a good job. Plenty of homework, plenty of work. Thorough on that. So we're basically looking right now at just phase one. My intent is to bring you back very quickly uh, a preliminary, a com as complete a preliminary subdivision application as I can bring for phase one, so that I'm really hoping that hopefully in the next two meetings, perhaps, that, you know, I'll have preliminary and final for phase one. Um, with the full understanding, again, that this is our ultimate goal, that, again, we're not trying to, you know, uh, but that's, I'm in, we're in a situation right now that we really can't proceed along with these plans until uh, something else happens that's kind of out of our control, so. So you're talking you'll have the stormwater permits for the whole project? Uh, that is our intent, and yes. And traffic impact for the whole project? Well, well at least I have a tra I'll have a traffic movement permit through the Sorry, state Mary. of Maine for the whole project, okay? okay? Obviously, I'll be scaling back what we were proposing working through the town because that town is all based upon the full build-out. So 
And the other question that I had looking at it prior to this was the buffer between those lots 10 and 13, and you've addressed that uh, very well. I mean, those neighbors have been there. And the sidewalk, you know where I am on the sidewalk. I think the $45,000 impact fee is enough to pay for a sidewalk by the town. Yeah, um, Dan, clarify for me the tower situation. There's a couple of issues here. Uh, yeah, the, um, the current requirements for transmission towers, um, so working off what's in the zoning ordinance now, not what was uh, reviewed and discussed earlier this evening on the amendments, uh, transmission tower needs to be um, the height, it was 100 percent of the height of the tower needs to be um, essentially a radius or diameter shown on the parcel that it's located on. So you cannot create a parcel smaller than 100 percent of the height of the tower in terms of its size. Um, so right now the tower is on this large property, the, the latent property that's all one parcel. The earlier, the current plan or earlier plans too showed that tower being on a small lot with new house lots next door to it where um, it wouldn't meet that 100% um, um, lot size requirement. So they're uh, sort of struggling with how to design the subdivision to, to meet that requirement in the ordinance and can't do it with the current layout of uh, where the proposed road is. Um, and therefore need to wait to see how the transmission tower amendments play out to see if there's the allowance through the amendments to uh, to have a smaller lot size for the tower that would enable their project design to move forward, at least the phase two that Sean referred to move forward. You, you also had a, a, uh, a note about tower lot as, as it's depicted uh, the plan should clearly note the lot is unbuildable and that any subsequent use other than the existing tower lot will require further review and approval by the planning board. Is that something that we have to put into our stipulations or is that just a given? Do you follow what I'm trying to say here? Maybe I can help you just a little bit with that because uh, uh, we worked with this board and it was always 99 lots, 99 lots. And I think we all came, okay, 99 lots. And of course, I always had the tower lot shown on there. And it was a lot. We had it as a tower lot. Uh, I think Jay wanted to be very clear is that, uh, you know, obviously the lease of that lot is up in 2018. Uh, that if we ever wanted a hundredth lot, since we always talked 99 with you folks, that we came back in 2018 and asked for a hundredth lot. That was my understanding of the situation. Okay. okay. So that lot is not a house lot <laughs> until after 2018 if the lease isn't reviewed or renewed, rather. Okay. My next needing clarification. Does this have to go to the state DEP in addition to us? I, I, I'm a little confused. It does not need state site location of development review, which is the uh, review process for subdivisions of this size because the town received municipal capacity for that review. So the town's ordinances are sufficient for that review now, but it does need DEP stormwater review, which is um, okay. a lesser review process focused on stormwater. So that's, okay, thank you. So it still needs that, um, that part of it, that state level permitting. And just to be clear, we also will go into a Natural Resource Protection Act review associated with the wetland impacts, which again, as we get back to phase one, uh, are very minimal for phase one. So uh, um, that may be, that's probably going to be the one permit I won't have in hand at that point in time um, is for the overall wetland impacts, because I think we'll just do that when we come back to you folks at some point, because then we'll actually be impacting the wetlands. Okay, the, the other comment I have at this stage is uh, the fact that when the road is being built and so forth, that there be the, you know, the least amount of impact uh, going on as far as the wetland is concerned. And, and we've worked hard on that, and I appreciate it, and I, and I saw where Jay was coming, and of course we tried to limit at least to the, where the edges of it, if you would be, or where the fingers were, so that we weren't impacting the, the, the larger wetlands. Uh, uh, and again, I okay, but you know, we're talking about a wetland impact on on an 80-acre parcel of about a half an acre. 
um, you know, on a site that again has over 13 and a half acres of wetlands on there. So, um, you know, uh, aware of the opinion, and, and again, we've met with the DEP and the Army Corps, and, and we have a process worked out through them to go through NRPA to allow that uh, that permitting to occur. Um, but you know, we thought for uh, uh, for the amount of roadway we were talking about in through here that you know we really had minimized that wetland impact, and I certainly hope the board has. And again, at least I would say is this is almost identical, at least from the general layout perspective of what we looked at with you folks uh, at the beginning of the year on the sketch plan provisions in terms of the wetland impacts. Thank you. Thank you. My last comment is that I agree with my colleagues. I'm not wishy-washy about this one. I don't think you should be required to do the uh, sidewalks off premises. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Susan. Wow. <laughs> Not for a few minutes, anyway. Um, it seems to me that we're going to have to have a chart of what impacts are going to come in when. I mean, what what not impacts, but what. That's I mean, why we're trying to do it all at once, but we can't do but it. We can't do it. That's so we have to have a listing. Well, I will just say phase one is the most minimal of anything. So mm. phase one is going to have, I mean, it will have its own traffic impact. Okay, it's going to have very minimal wetlands, but again, that'll be through DEP, so they'll know exactly what that number is. I guarantee okay, you, Okay, I hear you. I hear you. This is huge. It's mammoth. It is beyond my ability to take it in, how big this is. So it's going to be a little inconvenient for everybody, but we must make sure that our I's are dotted and our T's are crossed, and I'm sure that staff will make sure that happens, but I'm on overwhelm. It's just amazing to me that we're doing this. But I know that you do a good job. Um, um, did did anything happen with the um, note from the Conservation Commission about vernal pools? Uh, yes, I, had, I there's a note on the plan. I think there was, specifically that there were no there were no pools. vernal pools. Okay, fine. Um, get back to that one. Okay. Um, so the traffic, the traffic study is at full build out, correct? Correct. Yes. I will have a traffic movement permit through the state of Maine for the full okay. build out. Okay. Um, I'm still a little confused. We are going to be doing. The town is going to be doing what the DEP would normally do. Uh, for the site location of development, what, the, what basically the, the DEP has done is to review your ordinances right. and your requirements right. and say, geez, they pretty much mimic exactly. ours. They so exactly where, mimic the, ours. So why are we looking at the same thing? No, I understand how that works, but there was some. But some not some for stormwater, okay? So stormwater is going specifically through okay. that. Okay. Also, right. not for traffic. Yeah, no, not, not for traffic. The traffic, traffic, that traffic that is not DEP. Right. Um, okay. I don't want any big signage at those parking areas either. There are two locations, but each one will have more than two parking. Yes, I think this will be the small. My feeling is again because this is just going to be a hammerhead turnaround, so maybe three or four spaces here. Yeah, that one I think down there going down there was more five. like five or six. Okay, that's good. Okay, we're going to have um, lots to watch. Uh, by the way, I definitely think that um, the First Avenue, is it First Avenue off-site? Yes. It should be uh, included in this. Um, you know, impact fees are not something that happen. They're, 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 uh, they're included on how big the development is. You do a small development, your impact fee is small. You do a large development, your impact fee is large. So it, it's, it's all due to a certain formula. So I don't think that the impact fee is all that outrageous. And um, The problem is, Susan, when you're asking for an impact fee today for a house that's going to get constructed 10 years from now, that's where our problem is. It's never, it's, it's, I don't think it always comes up as, but it's, it's not just how much it is, it's when you pay it. All right? So, I mean, a lot of times you wind up paying everything before you even put a shovel in the ground. And you'll be amazed about what those numbers can come no, up with. No, I uh, Actually, we've been modifying the payment schedule for traffic impact fees. Good. So we've been working with people on by phase or by building permit. So that shouldn't be. I was going to ask if it, was, if it was, had gotten We're to by phase. We're glad to hear that. A concern. Yeah. I, think it's by, hear that. I think it's by phase, or it's supposed to be by phase. So anyway. Santa district is different. 
<laughs> We're going to go down there and ask the same thing, so that'll be interesting as well. There you go. Anyway, uh, yes, I'm a big fan of. Uh, I'm greatly in favor of getting a really good sidewalk um, system going in Scarborough, and something this big has got a huge impact. And so, yes, I think that we should have off-plan sidewalks. In the meantime. Good luck. It's huge. I'm looking forward to seeing phase one. Phase I'll one. So, again, I just want to be perfectly clear, folks. And, again, it's it's not that we're trying to – again, this is what we were always going through. But next time I'll be in, it's going to yep. be phase one and phase one only. Yep. That's good. Thank okay. you. I have nothing else. Um, I guess the first thing I want to comment on, and if I'm wrong, Mr. Bacon, please correct me, but my understanding is that traffic impact fees are for intersection improvements. It has absolutely nothing to do with building sidewalks. Right. Intersections so, aren't part of sidewalks. <laughs> Every time I build an intersection, Mr. Chairman, they certainly want a sidewalk, it seems. so. so my, my point <laughs> being is that the sidewalk issue that we're talking about along Green Acres is really not something that the town would use traffic impact fees for to enhance because they actually enhance um, the intersection and the movements around the intersection, if you will, and not necessarily, you know, pedestrian ways to the extent that we're hoping that um, sta or that staff is basically talking about in terms of sidewalks. So that, that to me is just a point of clarification from my perspective. So I do not view traffic impact fees as being um, the monies that would be used to fulfill that request. I think this is something totally separate, and I think this is clearly a, I guess for a lack of a better word, I'll use goodwill issue that we're looking at the applicant for um, in terms of the size of the development and overall community improvement. Um, I'll leave that at that. I'm a little disappointed that we still have a couple of lots with wetland on it. Uh, again, in accordance with the sketch plan, Mr. Chairman, those are specific conversations we had. We got, I think it's only one that I have the wetland on it. Uh, it's lot 24 and <laughs> lot 45. Okay. Um, <coughs> we may have had a conversation, but you never would have gotten No, and I know I never got you, but I do having wetlands on private go. property. So, like I say, as I said earlier, I got to ask. So that's just one of those things that, you know, we speak about rain gardens and some of the other um, items that we're trying to do in terms of stormwater management. We don't have much of anything protecting those wetlands uh, once the development is made. They just get filled in and we lose them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my personal opinion is if we're going to lose them, let's lose them properly. Let's have proper mitigation processes and, and uh, procedures in place and try to restore some wetland in another area where it may make more sense to um, keep the total amount instead. I appreciate the rules and you got to be more than one acre and all the other. I, I get it. I'm just saying that we're losing it and we just flat out lose it. And that's, from my opinion, you know, part of the basis of uh, the beginning of our eco ecosystem. And we just keep eroding it away, and it bothers me. So I don't like to see it on private property, but I think you know that. I, <laughs> yes, I do. Um, other items. And I'm going to try to keep some of these comments more down to what would be phase one. In that phase one area, um, I'm trying to remember, but I believe that when we were looking at this site for another development several years back, we did a site walk out there and along uh, the Honeywell Hill neighborhood on what I'm going to call, although I know it's not north, but on the north side of your drawing, if you will. I believe there's a stone wall that goes along back that 
Right here, yeah. That line uh, in that tree line. And there it is. Yes. I'm hoping that that's another area that we don't disturb in terms of when you're putting in whatever swales you're going to be putting in there. For that's why I'm not putting in swales. That's my whole point is I okay. wouldn't know. So, yeah, I hope we don't do that. Again, and if we have 100 feet of depth, and that's what you know, and again, we've been talking about this quite a bit. I mean, you have a setback requirement associated. you got the building. Obviously, people like a front yard. I mean, yep. a backyard associated with it as well. I mean, certainly the hope is that, you know, out of 100 feet, 25 can be left pretty much alone. If we don't have to get back there and start swaling it, yep. those types of things. And again, I think in this case, at all, the water, you know, it's pretty much. I mean, it's concentrated in a few spots, but I, I certainly think we don't have to do anything. Yeah, some of those, some of those walls have been there for a so long, I think we can long leave those walls, and I think we can leave a, a decent yep. stand of trees. You know, the other the other thing we did before uh, before we granted uh, any approvals or preliminary approvals for the other development was there was actually additional <coughs> landscaping, if you will, or trees, I think, that were going to be added against that back property line. Well, again, I think for backyards versus what was more of a commercial development, I could appreciate yeah. that additional landscaping. So, but uh, all the more reason why I hate to see any trees removed in that area, if at all possible. I appreciate that. So, um, since the trailhead parking, although it's going to be temporary in phase one, is there, um, I guess while I'm making a comment about phase four in regards to uh, public access, I am challenged to understand what anybody is going to access off the phase four parking area. They're going to walk down the sidewalk and connect to the trail. There's going to be a trail that's going to be connected right up to that spot. We're, we're, I, I, and I don't, I don't know if I have it in front of me on this particular plan, um, but I think it was coming down right in through here, down along the pond, and then connect back to the trail. Because I'm missing it. It looks like there's nothing but a great big piece of wetland. Well, the parking space is over here, so I'm trying to see how we publicly access. They're going to walk along the, the road on the sidewalk, all right, and then. I have a pond back here, and I'm going to connect your trail system down along this edge, along the pond, and back to your trail. Outside of the wetlands, so I'm not impacting wetlands, <laughs> in association with the trail extension and or the parking associated with access to them. Yeah. So, I mean, you'll have to walk, but I mean, I, that's what uh, you're going there to do, right? Is walk. So, I mean, <laughs> you can walk 100 walk feet the up the sidewalk, and then I'll have a trail for you. Okay, I guess I'm just missing it on the plan. No, and again, it's not real detailed on this plan, obviously. I think it probably shows better on, on one of the construction drawings. Yeah, we'll look okay. At, look at sheet three. Sheet three. Okay. Okay. And I'd love to make a direct access down there, Mr. Chairman, but you can see there's a wetland right there. <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to. Yeah, pretty good size one. Absolutely. I agree. All right. In I, intact, you might notice. I was just looking at the subdivision plan on page five and having trouble. Okay. I just want to make sure it's going to something. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> I understand you know? that. Um, okay. I guess that's where I'm at for now. And... Um, it's not the company. It's not the company. It's time. I'm good. Okay. Well, do you, what do you need from us? I'm going to ask you this simple question. Can we uh, can we uh, postpone the conversation of the off-site sidewalk construction until we come back with the the full approach and, and not have to worry about it as part of phase one? Is everyone comfortable with that for 23 Absolutely. lots? Yep. Absolutely. Yep. For 23 lots, yes. I am comfortable with that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Is there anything else you need from us, Mr. Frank? I don't believe so. Ben, good? Right. We appreciate your time, and again, what we really wanted to just make very clear was is, is why we're going to be back with something just a little bit different for the folks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay? Oh, no, we get it. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Our next item this evening <coughs> Town Planner's Report. Very late for me. 
Um, yes, uh, let's see. Three of you are on Long Range Planning Committee, so you're aware of this. Um, but the Long Range Planning Committee has been working on updated zoning in the Gorham Road area, um, both sides of Gorham Road west of the main turnpike, the vicinity of the Nunsuch Golf Course. Um, and so that initiative was reviewed by the council at their last meeting. So at your next meeting, there will be a public hearing um, on the, that package of zoning updates. Um, on, I think it's what, July 14th, um, there would be that public hearing. Um, and the only other update, in case it hasn't been relayed to the board yet, in the transportation trail bike ped world, the town did receive some significant funding from um, PACS and Maine main DOT for a trail extension from for the Eastern Trail from the Wainwright ball fields in South Portland down to the Pleasant Hill Road. So that's half of the, the current gap in the Eastern Trail. Uh, there's a 1.6 mile gap between basically. Does that include the bridge? It's the cheaper half that doesn't include the million dollar bridge. Okay. Um, so no, it's, it, it's not the section from Pleasant Hill over the Nunsuch River, but it's the northern section. Um, but it is an important segment that mm -hmm. will connect um, more of the South Portland side down into Scarborough. Um, so, and that'll be designed and maybe constructed uh, as soon as this winter or next spring time frame. So, yes. Um, that's what I have good, good, for the good. moment. Thank you. Uh, administrative amendment report. There's two administrative amendments. One was increasing the height of the building. The other was decreasing the height of the building. <laughs> um, the increase in height is uh, Scarborough Property Holdings, the gas station convenience store car wash up at Payne Road and Ginn Road uh, needed to modify the, the height, the building height of the car wash in a modest fashion to um, I think it was more of an interior mechanical adjustment that needed to be made in terms of the car wash system. So the elevations are the same. You know, the look of the building, the facade, is just going to be, I think, four and a half feet taller. Um, that was approved. And then some of the board members may remember the self-storage facility approved on Southgate Road in the Scarborough Industrial Park. Um, the actual self-storage buildings, most of them are, them are in, except for the main building that would have an office and a residence for the manager of the uh, facility. Um, as some of you may remember, that was a pretty tall structure because there's going to be storage units available in that building. They've modified the plan to eliminate that component, so the height of the building has been reduced. Um, the aesthetics, the, the architecture is the same, largely, um, and the like. Um, so it's a reduction in the size of that building that was approved by Alan through this process. Okay. Correspondence. Seeing none. Planning board comments. I have one. I'm hoping Mr. Fellows is available on the 14th. I am on vacation. I will be here. I will, I will be among the missing at the next meeting. Anything else? Motion to adjourn. Uh, we have a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? second? We have a second. Can't Any discussion? I can't, but I can't vote for it. All in favor. <laughs> I show that to be passed. Good evening.